106 miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. Hey everybody, it's the crew of Chicago Corner and Hardlands Media. I'm Jerry. I'm Kira. I'm Kit. And Ed. Be sure to join your crew at Chicago Corner and Hard Lens Media for our first annual food and toy drive at Patio Theater. That's 6008 Irving Park Road on December 23rd, starting at 5.30 p.m. Folks, this is a big event. It's our first time ever food and toy drive. We will be collecting shelf-stable canned food and new unwrapped toys to pass along to the Greater Chicago Food Depository and the Chai Gives Back Chicagoland Toy Drive. This is a chance to do good for the people living here in the city of Chicago, plus it's the holiday spirit, so if you don't got it, get it, and if you don't get it, go figure it out. We begin our live stream here in the lobby at 5.30 p.m. We will be greeting all of you good people that bring us canned food and toy donations. Make sure to warm up your vocal cords, because we start with a sing-along. Solstice at 7, Home Alone at 8. All you got to do for half-off admission to the show is bring shelf-stable canned food or a toy. Help us help others. Merry Christmas, and please join us. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to another Friday night edition of Chicago Corner. And I've got some exciting news that I can confirm that I kind of teased with Kira on Tuesday night, but canned food and a toy donation doesn't get you half off admission to the double feature. No, no, no. You get free admission. Thanks to the generosity of the Patio Theater, they will allow us to have all of our attendees who bring shelf-stable canned food or a new unwrapped toy to the Patio Theater on December 23rd for our special live stream toy food drive screening extravaganza. They will allow you in for free for the double feature of my film Solstice and uh, Chris Columbus's Home Alone. Two, hopefully you'll think mine is fantastic. Home Alone certainly is. But two Chicago Christmas Eve classics that you can see on the big screen with the community in Portage Park and hopefully uh, neighbors from all the surrounding areas. So please do come out and join us on December 23rd. We've got a really good show for you tonight, everybody. Uh, we have a special guest, but before I introduce him, I did a little bit of research pre-show uh, because it's very interesting. The 48th Ward, uh, the 48th Ward election for the new alder person is full of 10 candidates. Um, I want to quote from uh, MSNBC what they shared, and I'm sorry, MSN in this article below. Uh, let's see if I can get to the point where they're talking about the 48th Ward. Um, where is it? Why can't I? Oh, here we are. We have to continue reading. That's what it is. All right. So here we go. Wait, you know what? Why don't I just, let me see if I can quote it from our show notes, because I know that I have it in there also for anybody who hasn't looked at the show notes and, and bear with me. Cause I'm, cause I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. Um, Let's see here. Google Notes, Google Show Notes. Here we go. So as far as the 48th Ward race goes, the 48th Ward race to succeed retiring Alderman Harry Osterman is even more crowded with 10 candidates who have filed to run. Joe Dunn, Isaac Freilich Jones, Andre, Andre Peliquin, Lenny Mana Hoppenworth, Brian Hogg, Nick Ward, Larry Svebeck, Nasir Faulkner, Roxanne Volkman, and Andy Peters all submitted petitions. Now, I went to the websites of all 10 candidates. I saw a recurring theme on a lot of these candidates as far as the issues. 
uh, Dunn's website, Improve Public Safety, Keep Our Ward Affordable, Neighborhood Schools. Isaac's website, I'm running for alderman to fight for the 48th Ward where housing is affordable, government is accountable, schools are funded, and communities are safe. There's a theme there. Andre, who has a background in real estate, which concerns me about gentrification, but we don't know yet. Uh, his big issues are housing, senior safety, services, schools, immigration, healthcare, small business, LB, LGBTQ. Hannah Hoppenworth. She, her website, front page, she's a queer woman of color, small business owner, daughter of Filipino immigrant, safety, housing, and health, and human rights. Not too thrilled with the identity politics that lead that, but all right, it seems like her heart's in the good, right place. HOG, safety for our ward in the city, public schools, affordable housing, pro-union, pro-bodily autonomy. Uh, Larry Svebeck, progressive problem solver, diversity, entrepreneurial and fun-loving, safety and health, housing, affordability, protecting our environment and renovating our infrastructure, supporting LGBTQ plus community and women, strengthening our local economy, providing a high quality education for every child. I give Svebeck some credit because he did go into some details. Faulkner, uh, there's nothing on his website but a bio. Volkman, she doesn't have a website either, just Twitter. Uh, she's a federal government expert on housing and fair wages, daughter of a UAW member, Gen Xer, working a mom who gets it done. No platform, uh, aside from a couple of buzzwords that we've heard from a lot of the other candidates. Peters has no website. Now, our guest tonight, Alderman Nick Ward, he has a website. Not only does he have a website, he has a whole long page listing his priorities. And let me, uh, let me share some of them because he does go into a lot of detail. Uh, specific detail regarding a lot of issues we talk about here on Chicago Corner a lot. Support the Chicago's Teachers Union and all union school workers on their fights for fair contracts. Support the removal of police from our police institutions and replace them with social workers that the Chicago Teachers Union fight for COVID safety plans that prioritize proper ventilation, cleaning procedures, vaccination drives testing and personal protective equipment so that the schools are safe for in-person learning and that the likelihood of clustered outbreaks is dr drastically diminished. Support the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance, which would strengthen protections for renters and require landlords to pay relocation assistance when evicting tenants without just cause. Strengthen legislation that preserves housing for low-income renters and provide permanent affordable housing for people experiencing homelessness, which we talk about what? Every broadcast, build affordable multi-bedroom housing for families to help combat enrollment loss in local CPS schools, close the housing gap and prevent families from leaving the city altogether. Environmental justice, support democratizing ComEd and all of our utilities so that critical services are guaranteed for all residents and aid our transition to net zero emissions. Now, I'm about to introduce our guest, and then my co-host for the evening, but um, Mr. Ward, do you watch our show to hear that we're talking about all this stuff all the time? I love this. I, I, you know, <laughs> I'll be honest, this is the first time I have seen the show, but this is wonderful. And I think that, you know, you're talking about the issues that I talk about every day. And I really appreciate that. Um, also, as I referenced before, my, my cat's playing a little... A little bit of tomfoolery with the with the um, the camera here, but uh, hey, just a quick um, quick quick point of clarification. Um, you did call me the alderman of the 48th ward. I'm, I'm well, you <laughs> hopefully you will be. I can't vote in the 40th. I'm mean, in the 50th, but I would be honored to come back here. You know, next April 6th um, as the alderman. But uh, just want to clarify that. We are in my excitement introducing you, I, I, I overstepped or misspoke, although I have to say, having read how you have been very, very specific about identifying your priorities as opposed to all those other websites. And really, I wanted when I saw that this race was full of 10 other candidates, I'm like, whoa, what do they stand for? So we can yeah. hear what you stand for. And I, I did an honest assessment of all the websites. As I mentioned, I wasn't too thrilled that like identity politics um, seem to be at the front end of one candidate's website. And a lot of the same buzzwords uh, regarding public safety, keep our ward affordable, neighborhood schools, blah, 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 without any real detail on how they want to support those initiatives. So before we continue, Nick, I do want to also welcome to the show 
Uh, my co-host for the evening, Mr. Kit Cabello of Hardlands Media. Kit, cheers and back. salutations. I've been looking forward for this city election cycle. I am hoping that finally we get people that will fight for this city and help out the constituents that live here. Despite all that you see on corporate media, Chicago is filled with good people, and this city is worthwhile to defend and build up. We just got to really s turn out for 2023. Yeah, I love that. Thanks, Kit. No problem. Absolutely. And our venerable Mr. Edward Heller. How's it going? Uh, I look forward to hearing your opinions on Chicago pizza. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, whoa, I wasn't prepped for this. That's okay. Yeah. We'll be gentle. You better make the correct answer and say Chicago is the correct pizza. So there you go. That's Edward is our <laughs> pizza aficionado here. And a damn good cook and, and pizza chef. I, I do my I do my part. So, Mr. Ward, uh, let, let's let's kind of get into it. Uh, as you know, this is a pretty you know laid back, casual talk show. We we can be irreverent, but as I mentioned in the pre show, we will be re we're always respectful when we have guests on. We get a little bit jokey though sometimes, so please forgive our irreverence if that comes up. Um, but to start with, one of my main questions I thought was that with ten people jumping in the race because Harry Osterman is not running again. Would you have decided to enter this race had Osterman not uh, announced that he was not running for re-election? And if so, what were uh, some of Alderman, Alderperson Osterman's, I don't know, weaknesses that you felt weren't serving the community that you wanted to step up and address? Yeah, I, I actually, I was running uh, against Harry Osterman. Um, I announced my candidacy um, online. We kicked off on January 25th, I think, of this year. And we had an in-person launch event at Rewired Cafe at, on Feb in February. So I was running uh, to go up against Harry Osterman. And I, I felt um, really, really excited about the possibility. We built this platform that you referenced. I built it with the, with the whole team. So I work, I work with uh, an organization called the 48th Board Neighbors for Justice that also works with other organizations around the city. And so the platform was built, you know, with um, with CTU members in mind, with uh, the Edgewater Environmental Coalition members. It was built with folks from United Working Families who are working on climate justice action all of the time. And so that's what I'm really proud that you, you know, honored that because for me, I, I built it in a, in a group of people. Um, wasn't just me scribbling down my thoughts, though there was certainly a lot of that. And then I had my campaign manager say, this is way too long. And you got to be a lot more specific. <laughs> but one, but the main reason that I felt strong about running against a three-term incumbent who's has a beach named after him in the 48th Ward is I did a lot of work here, uh, particularly around um, mutual aid, right at the height of the pandemic. And so I saw the the real need of you know working families in the community, of seniors in the community. I got you know, groceries and resources to people um, all of the time, and especially during the height of, of 2020. And, and I really noticed how there was so much more need than a, a ragtag group of volunteers could really, could really meet, you know, and I thought, well, what could we do if we had, you know, the, the, quite frankly, the power and the visibility of the ward office, because I, I wasn't seeing it coming out of that office. And I thought that was a real, you know, real moment for me. Um, and there are other sources of disagreement that I had with Alderman Harry Osterman, uh, some of which I was very public about. I didn't think he was very supportive of unionized employees. You know, I was there when the, the Starbucks workers won their union election um, on, on Broadway in Catalpa. And I was the only, I was the only <laughs> political candidate um, or politician from the 48th Ward who was there to, to celebrate and support them. Um, and then if I may, you know, there's a story that I like to share. Yes. And it, it, it's, you know, minor in the scope of things, but it's meaningful to me. So um, I'm on the local school council at Gaudi Elementary School. I'm a community representative. And when the kids were coming back um, after you know being out of school due to COVID, the school um, had a one and a half janitorial positions available. So it had one full-time janitor um, and then a, a part-time janitor that was allocated, but it wasn't being filled. And these are union positions, 
Um, these are SEIU 73 union jobs. And the principal had called CPS. They had tried to get in touch with the board of election. They had tried to call the alderman and they, they weren't getting anywhere just to get a part-time janitor to help make sure that the school was clean and safe for kids to come back to. And so I worked and partnered with the 48th Ward Neighbors for Justice independent political organization. And we spent two days uh, organizing a phone zap and just called Harry Osterman every 10 minutes to um, get him to pick up the phone. And he did finally. And by the beginning of next week, Gowdy had a part-time janitor. And I thought to myself, wow, if it's that easy, just, you know, just to pick up the phone, what can we do if there's somebody in that seat who is proactive and working on behalf of, you know, working class families all the time? More and receptive. Or receptive. And more, yeah, more receptive. More receptive. Yeah, more, more receptive. And it, it wasn't me saying, I want to do this. It was me saying, what if we had this, a, a person in this role who had these kinds of of proactive values. So you, a lot of a lot of your platform and your candidacy is very dependent on input from 48th Ward residents, uh, yeah. so, uh, 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 neighbors in that ward. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background uh, before you decided to jump into this race? What your experience is that you feel also helps uh, position you as a strong candidate? I mean, a lot. Look, I I, I was very very impressed again with everything you you share here with your priorities. Thank but you. I, let's talk a little bit about your experience and how that plays into actually uh, being able to accomplish a lot of, um, you know, what you have identified as your priorities for the ward. Yeah, so I moved to Chicago in 2004. Um, I went, I'm from Michigan. Originally, my parents were public school teachers. I went to theater school in Ohio. And so <laughs> like a lot of Midwest uh, theater graduates, I came to Chicago to participate in the, um, you know, the vibrant theater scene here. So 2004, I landed um, and I got immediately activated in the storefront community, but not, not really, I actually ended up not doing much acting. I, I wasn't very good at it, to be frank with you. And um, it wasn't really where I was, I was being called. So I did a lot of production management with storefront theaters um, I linked up with a storytelling organization called Second Story, where I am still a company member um, as a storyteller, educator, and kind of producer, curator type. So um, I've produced a lot of events with a lot of different people in many different spaces around Chicago. So far, it's logistics. I, I can share also as a producer director. <laughs> if it, I mean, what we do <laughs> is all about logistics. So clearly, you know, as long as you have that organizational foundation, I mean, you're basically taking that organizational experience and shifting it to public service and civic action. That That's exactly right. And, you know, you, you, you kind of put the words in my mouth, so I won't repeat what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but like many folks who uh, do that work, I was um, uh, under and uh, more often than that unpaid. And so I supplemented my income waiting tables. So I worked in, I worked as a waiter for 20 years. I started working in restaurants when I was 17. And really it was in Chicago where I saw a lot of the, um, the real disparities built into the, that, that economic system in the restaurant industry, you know, working alongside um, busters and food runners who worked multiple jobs, often in different parts of the city and relied like I did on public transportation to get them everywhere that could be quasi reliable. Um, you know, and worrying about making enough tips every night for, for my own rent and bills and groceries. Um, and then I spent four years just recently at an organization called Young Chicago Authors, where I, um, and I should say, if for those who don't know YCA, um, the organization teaches uh, hip hop and spoken word to young people all across Chicago. And so I had colleagues who would come up to the programs as youth you know, and said like, this program saved my life. Um, and I, I met, you know, young folks who, who are in the programs currently talking about what it meant to them. And, and also just um, seeing them just on fire with, with really having, you know, a space where they could be themselves and they could be with other people just like them, you know, like people who wanted to, to spend all day writing poems um, at 17, 18 years old. And so I saw kind of the that the need for that container for young folks um, 
Like, I, you know, I grab you, you, you have no political experience. That's right. But that might, but that might not be a liability. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, let's get people in there who are like connected with the community, who are actually like yeah. understand the struggles of what people are going through, um, instead of you know the same rotation of oh, small business owner, real estate person. Uh, you know, w w I, those are going to be very, very important yeah. issues facing anybody who run who, who wins that seat in that ward. You know, supporting local business and supporting, uh, you know, safety and stuff, but you know, the issues that impact so many people that don't have a roof over their head or can't afford, uh, or, or there is no affordable housing for, yeah. or they're not getting fair wages in these small businesses or large businesses. Yeah. You have a connection with understanding what those challenges and, and struggles are, as opposed from, you know, some candidates who might be disconnected because they, they haven't dealt with the same kind of issues. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, I... I the the level like I, I rented and I'm still a renter um and I because of that you know I bounced around in so many different neighborhoods right just trying to find a place where I could call home and I think that's real that's what everybody wants you know we all want that experience we all want a place where we can feel loved and taken care of and and that's what I found here in in the 48th ward um but also I think that what really prepares me for this role from that political perspective that you mentioned is getting involved with local organizations who are doing political work. So it's, it's, you know, they're, they're, yes, my background is, is as a theater artist and a waiter um, primarily, but also um, it's being on so many zoom calls talking about policy. It's being on so many calls talking about, hey, this strike is happening. Can we organize support for these workers? Because they really need it. Who can come during these shifts? You know, that stuff, like I am activated in that very direct way, which is exciting. I would also opine here that performing is all about collaboration. And yeah. if you can take that sense of collaboration into civic action yeah. and actually listen to the people in your community and, and advocate for them, and not just special interests or <clears throat> some of the other crony alder people, yeah, you know that that's a good thing. I I don't want to bogart the conversation here. I know that uh, mm -hmm. that um, Kit and Ed will probably have some questions, but I do want to really quickly add before I turn it over to some of what they want to ask, is that some of the big issues that we always talk about here are police reform, homelessness, yeah. and gentrification, as it really does seem to affect a lot of communities on well all across the city. Gentrification, especially in the north side. So um, those might be some topics we want to kind of get a little bit deeper into, but um, Kit, uh, what would you like to uh, ask Nick here? All right. Um, obviously, Chicago is suffering from a lot of political issues due to the negligence of, well, of a system that is designed to only cater to large real estate developers, the politically connected, and so much more. So uh, one thing in particular that uh, I am passionate about is stopping environmental racism and protecting our communities. Now, um, the city of Chicago has lead in its drinking water. It just isn't a South side or West side issue. It's a North side issue. It's a Chicagoan issue. And the previous to two previous mayoral administrations, mayor Rahm Emanuel and mayor Lori Lightfoot have done little to nothing to really address it. Plus on top of that, we have other dangerous contaminants impacting our drinking water supply. Plus there's also an environmental racism happening on the South and West side neighborhoods of, uh, of, of Chicago. So as a potential alderman, do you have a chance of actually winning this election? And should you win this seat? Uh, what are you prepared to do to really deal with the ongoing environmental racism that is impacting Chicago? And while these areas may not be in your ward, uh, what impacts one part of Chicago well, it's going to impact every single part of it. It's going to be right there. So what are you prepared to do? Because there are a lot of political uh, elite, the establishment, the connected, that will do everything they can to keep business as usual. What are you prepared to do to really challenge the status quo and, well, protect the people of Chicago from this clear threat to our environment? Can I also add, Ed, I'm sorry, Kit, 
in your your question of um, of Nick here, what are you prepared to do about it? You're suddenly you're channeling Sean Connery from The Untouchables. Yeah, what well, are no, you prepared no, to do about yeah, it? Well, well, then, well, then, well, then make me the bad guy. Make me. The bad no, no, guy. it's not a bad thing. No, no, no. I'm glad. <laughs> I just it reminded me that that's that's a very demanding yeah. statement, but it's a very important one. Absolutely, we do have to ask all of our candidates, what are you prepared to do in light of so much of the cronyism and um, you know uh, our, our our the major leaders, the mayors. Uh, turning a blind eye and unfortunately a lot of lapdog older people just turning a blind eye to it. Although I do think some of the older people in those specifically affected wards have been trying to do stuff, but they've also yes. got the state, uh, the, the state EPA, yes. not the federal EPA that's come in to try to do some things to, to who we feel have been like basically aiding and abetting the environmental polluters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I, I, I want to just for, because it's more fun than talking about environmental racism up front. You know, the, the, the untouchables reference, I really appreciate. And like, you know, the, a new kind of Chicago way, though, if we're being honest, right? And I think that's what we're really after here in the next election cycle. And, and, and I want to say, too, Kit, your point about, you know, people of the, of the 48th Ward also being directly connected to folks on the South and the Southwest side is so, um, it, it's so uh, prescient. For me, you know, I, I think I want to end the provincialism of aldermanic um, seats, or I don't even know if I'm using provincialism correct in this way. But you know, oftentimes an, an alder person will say, "Well, the only thing I'm doing is for the, the residents of the 48th ward." But the residents of the 48th ward interact with workers who come here every single day. You know, workers who work at at 7-Eleven, at our coffee shops, at our restaurants, um, who you know work in the one of nine or so theaters that are here in Chicago or here in the 48th Ward that I really love, you know? So actually the way that Chicago works is people moving all throughout the city and they need the resources of a, a proactive alder person to really make sure that we're all getting what we need. You know, we need to end, and we need to end the practice of sacrifice zones. I mean, full stop. That's the biggest thing that's happening, I think. Um, I was thinking prior to the broadcast as I, you know, because as I mentioned, I can't vote for you. But from what I'm hearing, I would. Wouldn't it be great if every citizen in the city of Chicago could vote or had a responsibility to vote for older people in every ward to hopefully break that provisional is that prov provincial mindset in the understanding that if everybody's voting for the older people that they think really have the public's best interests in mind, that's a way to like break up the tribalism. Yeah, that seems to dominate so much of what happens in city council. Yeah. And, and so since we can't do that right now, um, what I'm really excited about is the opportunities that I've had to build coalition with um, other candidates who are running in similar positions around Chicago right now. And so I'm really, you know, this is why um, Angela Clay, who's running in the 46th Ward, and I have a, a great relationship, you know, that we're building a great political relationship because her ward is directly south of my ward. And what of what happens in the 46, particularly related to housing and gentrification, is happening in the 48. Um, but it's not just the north side. So a couple of nights ago, I had a um, uh, had a fundraiser and was really honored and proud that uh, Julia Ramirez who was running in the 12th ward um, out on the southwest side joined and spoke about you know, the struggles of her community and the ways in which that the, the 48th and the 12th Ward and the 26th and the 6th, you know, can all work together because that's what we have to do. We have to get a city council that actually works together. And we do that through solidarity, which, you know, you talked about buzzwords before. That's a buzzword that a lot of, uh, a lot of folks use. But I really believe that if we're really establishing the, and understanding our, our interlocking relationship, we have to have solidarity together. So you do, why, yeah. You do mention on your website under environmental justice that you believe in environmental racism is a citywide problem that requires a citywide solution. Yeah. We can combat environmental injustice by canceling contracts with polluters, investing in climate resilient and carbon neutral infrastructure, and refusing to give public space to corporations. Now, one of the points on your environmental justice priority platform is to reopen the Chicago Department of the Environment. How would re what does the I didn't realize we had a Department of the Environment. I didn't realize it was closed. Uh, what will reopening <laughs> yeah. do to help support uh, your your platform on environmental justice and uh, these problems of um, 
of environmental racism that uh, you know affect the entire city. So a little bit of um, a little bit of history there. The the, the previous Department of the Environment was a, a grant funded program. Um, I think it was a federal grant. I could be wrong about that. Y'all should fact check me at some point. But it was a grant funded program that the grant money ran out during Rahm Emanuel's administration. There have been calls from uh, older people for the last four years to reopen the Department of the Environment. Um, one of the, the folks leading that call is 47th Ward Alderman Matt Martin. Um, the ask from the environmental justice organizations, uh, the various PACs and community organizations, is a $10 million funding for an environmental justice program. What that would do is create a dedicated city program that works with all of the other departments to establish the interlocking policy proposals, right? Because we know that climate resiliency has to run through housing, has to run through the Department of Transportation, it has to run through workforce development. We want green union jobs, right? And so that what's happening now is that um, in the current budget, um, the one that was just passed, Mayor Lightfoot established an office of the environment funded at about seven hundred thousand dollars. Jesus Christ, um, seven hundred thousand dollars! The scale, is, the scale yeah. oh my God. is something. It really is. Um, it really it's is. Something. And and um, and you know, and and an office that's under the mayor's office can leave if there's another mayor. Next she's not too fun she can open up, Nick. That's the thing. She's not too fun she can open up. And if she's relying just on federal fund grant funding, then obviously it's not a priority to her. Right. That's the problem. Right. And so that's what that's what that department would do and what it would establish. And we've seen other departments utilize their their powers as city departments. And I think that that's what the Department of the Environment um, would do. And that's why I support it and why I'm excited about, you know, again, continuing to work with the next group of 15 plus new alder people next year to really fight for that climate resiliency that, that will benefit all of us. So have you formed alliances with some of the other challenges and other wards that you recognize sh uh, share the same platform that you do with a lot of the priorities you put on your website? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned I mentioned Angela Clay. Um, I'm also a uh, I'm also a DSA endorsed uh, alder alder person. Um, and so, you know, really have that alliance with the other uh, DSA challengers, uh, Oscar Sanchez in the 10th board and Luis Buani in the 50th are the others who are the challengers. Um, and I think that gives us an opportunity. Um, oh, I shall, I, I would be remiss if I didn't shout out uh, Denali Dasgupta, who's running against Samantha Nugent um, next year as well and is, is the, the only challenger in that race. And so we, we end up sort of being at the same events all of the time. And that gives us a real opportunity to just have regular check-ins um, and just say, like, how are things going? What are you hearing on the doors? How are you feeling about, you know, your fundraising, your field game? You know, what 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 is the possibility of getting us all to the finish line and beyond and elected? Because we're, you know, even if we're collegially building these roles, our, our policies are all really interlocking and we learn in alignment. and in alignment. Yeah. Kit, did you have a follow-up? Because I think I, I just felt that like the whole concept of the Department of Chicago, reopening the Chicago Department of the Environment mm -hmm. and, and, and Nick's uh, extrapolating on that kind of spoke to some of the issues well, that we're talking about. But go ahead. Well, OK, so I'll keep this at this. This will probably be out of your ability as an alderman, but you should be made aware of it. So. Uh, sometime in October, myself and a few of my colleagues from Hard Lens Media, uh, we did a follow up to a documentary that we did in 2018. And it has to deal with the environmental pollution that's happening in Indiana. And see, Lake Michigan um, obviously is connected to Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, et cetera, et cetera, uh, state of Michigan. And in Indiana, for example, there is a very big hands-off approach to the large industrial corporations that are there. And what they do is like dilution is a solution. They have toxic waste and other dangerous materials, dilute it with water, put it into Lake Michigan. And let's face it, Chicagoans, we have access to Lake Michigan as well. So as an alderman, if you were to potentially reopen that administration – would you use that position to maybe potentially reach out to the state of Illinois 
and other branches of our government, uh, be it at the federal level, to perhaps do something about the reckless pollution that's happening across our state. Now, obviously, you are an alderman. There are limits to your power. I was going to say. But, what, yeah, what no, is no that, that, is, that, is, that is true. Yeah. But, I mean, if, if, if we can get everyone at least raising the alarm, and even if that's at the aldermanic level, that makes noise for the, for the state to make noise and, for, and eventually for it to get to the ears in Washington, D.C., um, what, what would you be able to do? Um, are you aware of what's happening across our state? I really, uh, I, I appreciate this because I think that, yes, there are limits to power, but there is power and power has to be utilized. And part of the power is the visibility of that office, you know, and, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying about the, the small story that I told about the part-time janitor at Gowdy. You know, the CPS is not in direct relationship with, with um, the city of Chicago and the city council, but just having the, the power to, and the relationships to make that phone call, right? It's about building those relationships. So it's working with our, um, the ILGA folks who are in the 48th Ward, which for me is uh, Kelly Cassidy, Mike Simmons, and newly elected um, Representative Han Wynn, but also Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, right? It's making sure that we have a good relationship and building a relationship and making sure that we understand, hey, these issues that, that, that you know, require federal allocation affect people at Broadway and Thorndale every single day in the same way that they're also going to affect people, you know, on 47th street or 71st street, you know? And so I think you using the power of the office is really important and something that I'm really engaged in. I want to get Ed involved in the conversation also. Thanks for being patient, Ed. Is there anything that uh, related to what we've, we've talked about so far that, that you have some thoughts or questions about? Uh, Questions, no. Uh, but I mean, I was looking uh, just to to get an idea of like what the 48th ward looked like, because uh, we, we in past shows, we've talked about how the ward maps got redrawn and all this other stuff that went on. And I'm like, what does the 48th ward look like? And I'm like, I pull up a map, I type Chicago 48th ward. Oh, and yeah. I get, hold on, I got and you. I get this. Oh, this okay. is my also, result. Also hilarious that I'm the second uh, result there. You're the only other result. <laughs> so let me, I mean, this not is, a bad thing. I mean, like like Jay Mall getting uh, winning the lottery to be number one on the ballot for right. mayor. Uh, destiny works in funny ways. Yeah. So I mean, this yeah. basically what this tells me is that whoever is helping you out with your with your uh, campaign knows that people are going to Google 48th Ward and try to figure out what's going on there. And you're the only other name that pops up. That's brilliant. Thanks. Yeah. I, I cannot say enough about the team who built this campaign. Um, and like uh, from, from building the website to my campaign manager who I've been with since September of last year to the new field director we just brought on, to the volunteers who staff the office, writing postcards, texting, making phone calls. It's, it really is a people-powered effort. Um, but to answer your actual question about the ward boundaries, um, so it's a pretty rectangular ward. The, the topmost boundary is Devon, um, just on the south side of Loyola, basically. So the kind of main Loyola campus is in the 49th ward, so Devon, and then the lakefront, and then down on the lakefront towards, um, it stops at Ainsley. Yeah, here we go. Um, the, the residential part stops at Ainsley. The road and parks go down to Lawrence. And then if you scroll down a little bit to the bottom, keep scrolling. So it's not on this map, but if you see where Ainsley at the very bottom left, where it jets out there. Oh, yeah, right there. there. There's a there's a new block that goes from Ainsley, one block over to Magnolia, one block up to Argyle and back to Broadway. And that encompasses um, Fiorama restaurant, um, a new a new ramen spot, a row of adorable single family homes, um, the Zazian Library and a car wash. Um, and so that's the new the new boundary. And then it goes over to uh, Clark Street and Andersonville. So kind of bisects Clark Street between the 48th and the 40th. 
Okay, and let me bring up the other brilliant thing is that your your office is right next door to a Thai restaurant. Oh, the best. <laughs> I'm I'm like, how, that. how often are you guys ordering from there? <laughs> That's one of the hard hitting questions we bring to people here on Chicago Corner. Yeah, I mean, at least at least once, if not twice a week, and we we love them. They they take such good care of us. Um, you know, we'll we'll order. A mess of food when we have big volunteer days, um, but it's I can't say enough about gin tai and particular shout out to the boat noodles. You know, I, I I walk around this ward a lot sometimes in inclement weather, and the boat noodles get me through those really hard canvassing shifts when the weather is really disgusting. So love gin. Yeah, tai. I, we're we're big on supporting local business, and, yeah. and the local restaurant industry really had it handed to them during they the lockdown. Sure did. And, uh, they need as much support as we can possibly give them. Let's shift into another really important. Uh, well, I, I don't want to keep you on here all night, although you, you can stay as long as you want. But I'd uh, <laughs> le- le- like to hear some of your thoughts on police reform. Reform, not 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 defund. Yeah. Uh, there was a horrible, horrible phrase that uh, that activists use, defund. It should have been reallocate because that's what it's really about. But I would like, you know, one of the well, two of the points that we always bring up here is that we don't understand why uh, the mayor or the city council doesn't push or demand that police officers serve in the neighborhoods in which they live, mm. so that they're not looking at the people they're policing as potential enemies and threats to their lives, but as neighbors that they're yeah. in collaboration with to help keep the community safe. And the idea of us constantly paying out, uh, basically. Uh, covering their mess with uh, um, lawsuit uh, payouts all the time, lawsuit settlements all the time, instead of either them carrying insurance like medical doctors or attorneys or any other profession, or it comes out of their pensions for the mistakes because the constant bailing out of the police department with tax dollars doesn't hold them accountable. And all it does is enable the constant abuse of power within the ranks. And we're not anti-cop here. And I've said this a million times. I respect the ideals of what law enforcement is supposed to stand for, which sadly CPD, the fraternal order police don't seem to give a shit about (laughs) to be quite frank. So I'd like to hear some of your thoughts on police reform specifically as it relates to a lot of the scandals and and problems we've seen here in the city of Chicago. Yeah. I I think your, your point about the, the, um, the payouts and the public funds that go to cover misconduct is a really salient one, you know, and that's a thing that does stand in the way of good quality reform. Um, you know, I, I spent most of 2020 um, in the streets, uh, like a lot of people did. And a lot of it was fighting for the CPAC ordinance, um, which was the Chicago Police Accountability Council that eventually merged with the other ordinance to create ECPS. Um, the, the acronyms are just, uh, just sidebar, the acronyms are, are too much, but we have the um, empowering communities for public safety, you know, and what that, what that has done is create new police district councils of elected oversight bodies. And I'm excited to work with those elected oversight bodies because I think it's really critical that we're establishing that oversight to make sure that we're holding our officers accountable for misconduct and really having an honest conversation about what that might look like from a day-to-day perspective. You know, and I think the thing that's that's the thing that's so frustrating sometimes, if I can be honest about the 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 defund squabbles, you know, is that when we we need to really remember what we actually have defunded in Chicago, right? Housing and uh, public education. Mental and, health and mental is, a health. Big, and, is a big way to prevent the crime also. Yeah, which has and, been def- that's what's been defunded. Yeah, and quite, and quite literally streets and sanitation too. Mm-hmm. You know, so we have like necessary infrastructure programs and necessary public health programs and social service programs that aren't receiving the support that they need. And then when we do get actual money allocated in a city budget to hire public mental health professionals like we did last year, the city can't hire them fast enough, right? So that's a problem too. You know, we had, we had 30, I, I think the, the number is, is 31 allocated positions in the 2021 budget. And as of 
this year's budget hearings, only seven had been hired. Um, and that's really frustrating. And this, you know, to call back, this is a point of agreement that I have with Harry Osterman because he has publicly said, hey, look, we really need to be hiring these positions because the money is there, but we are running out of time. Yeah. You know, the people of this ward and other wards do not have time to wait for housing and mental health or harm reduction services. And the posting of jobs is a major concern and something that I'm really committed to as an older person is that, you know, better advertising those jobs when they do become available. So that's kind of how I think. I know I got a little bit off topic, but no, no, no they, they, they're all interlinked. Uh, Kit, do you have any any questions yeah. in this direction? Um, no, I think you guys are handling it perfectly well. I mean, I, I, if anything, I would add um, when it comes down to uh, and again, we're talking about police police brutality and uh, police corruption and so much more, right? That's, that's more or less yeah. where we're going. Yeah. Um, so what I would have to address in here is that you know in 2018. We did a coverage with the exoneration project where 16 black men were exonerated for crimes that they did not commit. And the thing is, yes, that was 2018, many years from now or many years ago, <laughs> knowing how crazy 2020 was, it almost seemed like 100 years going through that <laughs> year alone. <laughs> um, but the problem is, is that we were only still scratching the surface. So there are still people in Cook County Prison right now that are behind bars for crimes that they probably did not commit. Yeah. So if we're talking about justice reform, there are individuals that are in jail for for stuff that is, again, they didn't do. Yeah. And it's going to have to be done by a case-by-case -case basis. So what are you prepared to do to really bring that to the attention to the city council and to, and to the potential new mayor? Heaven forbid it's Lightfoot. Being yeah. What are you prepared to do? Yeah. Well, to your point, you know, to your point, sometimes we focus. I'll be the bad guy. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, bad guy. <laughs> sometimes we focus so much on the some of the day to day interactions that we see that get recorded, that get broadcast, that are just horrifying. But then also focus on the the interdepartment uh, malfeasance or you know, silly stories like uh, the recent one of a, a officer vacationing in Florida and public publicly urinating or something that I saw past my feed. But we aren't paying to we're fully thinking about the larger system that does include the Cook County Jail, right, where we do have um, folks who have been accused of crimes um, that are in many in many ways, they're very low level that just get passed through a judge in seven or eight seconds because the public defender's office is over, you know, over capacity. And so we've got that kind of system wide issue that we also need to work on. And that's, again, working with the the uh, Cook County commissioners on that as well, because the, the jail is their purview, too. And I think that that's what's what's been, um, you know, quite frankly, I'm encouraged to see that the the full pretrial fairness act past because there was a lot of fear mongering about what that would do. And it's, it's really common sense reform. And so I think we continue to need those reforms that really establish, um, you know, better systems in our, in our, you know, in our, both in our streets and with regards to the actual judicial systems like the Cook County Jail. Hyper-focusing again on local issues that would absolutely um, uh, be under your <clears throat> I guess, uh, your guidance in your ward and your housing platform. Um, you mentioned strengthening legislation that preserves housing for low-income renters and provides permanent affordable housing for people experiencing homelessness. I'm sick and tired of the tents ac across the city, especially along uh, the north side in the parks, under the viaduct, under the bridges. Uh, this, is, this is something that is an epidemic. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm heartened to see that this is a focus uh, in your priorities. My question regarding that is, since it is a very localized uh, type of, uh, of um, uh, issue uh, when you're dealing with homeless people in your ward, when you say strengthen legislation that preserves housing for low-income renters and provide permanent affordable housing for people experiencing homelessness, uh, 
what does that involve? I mean, obviously an alliance with other alder people and yeah. other wards. Uh, what what kind of legis? Because we just saw a couple of weeks back, uh, alder person Haddon and a bunch of progressive aldermen were trying to get uh, a referendum on uh, next February's ballot that would uh, increase some taxation on like the highest minimum amount of like really, really um, uh, expensive property owners in the city. And of course, there, there's a, a, I call it the uh, the hall of shame of the older people who did not show up yeah. to prevent that vote from actually being allowed to happen. So how do you see being able to put some teeth into strengthening legislation to protect our most vulnerable Chicagoans, the homeless, as, as we're seeing, you know, as we're getting ready for this really cold winter, Nick, yeah. it, it breaks my heart. It, it, knowing there's so much vacant housing, uh, vacant uh, buildings yeah, yeah. City that no money's going into to maybe retrofit that's just sitting there empty when we've got people who are, who are you know, freezing and, and don't have, I mean, they also need the mental health support. We, that's certainly a component as well, but yeah, let me shut up and let you speak. to. No, something. that's great. That, I'm glad you brought that up. So I, I, the, the, I was referencing that ordinance, bring Chicago home that, that Maria had and others were, were pushing for. And it's really unfortunate that they, you know, that there were certain mayoral allies who prevented that, you know, and ultimately like when we talk about the next year of, of Chicago politics, there is a part of it where it just does become a numbers game. Um, we have to be honest there. Sometimes we're going to need just numbers to get to get what we what we want passed, or at least to a referendum on the ballot. Um, another part that Bring Chicago Home would do would be um, would be addressing supportive housing and those uh, social programs. So kind of what what are you know commonly referred to as wraparound services, public mental health, harm reduction for for drug addiction, um, and then the other piece of that in terms of preservation is pretty multifaceted. So, um, you know, there's the, the single room occupancy hotels that are fast disappearing here in Chicago. Um, we wanna make sure we're able to preserve those, whether it's, um, you know, providing opportunities for those um, building owners to strengthen those buildings. Um, there was an Airbnb initiative also recently introduced. And that's another one. We talked one about too, a few yeah. shows back, yeah. The Airbnb initiative is one um, here in the 48th Ward, we have historic two flats and three flats um, mm -hmm. that also represent naturally occurring affordable housing. And I've seen uh, deconversion fee plans happen in um, the first ward and the 35th Ward um, with uh, Daniel Spada and Carlos Miras Rosa. And I'd, I'd love to, you know, look at how we might pursue something like that to make sure that those two and three flats that house anywhere from two to three families don't become places that only house one family. Right. And that, that also, <laughs> pardon, or, or sit empty or sit empty, you know, and that's partially where we're constrained as well. I think it, it does have to be multifaceted. It might have to get experimental. You know, I will say that I, I think there's a little bit of um, it's like a little bit of rancor for the maybe rancor is not the right word, but there's something for the tiny homes proposal. And I yeah, think we talked about that Tuesday. Yeah, it's like those are like lawn I sheds. Know, but, but everything has to be on the table, you know, and I yeah. think that's where I think about it is like the constant need to experiment through policy and initiatives and strategies um, and, and not get so. And another thing is we don't want to get so bogged down in not being able to responsibly build more housing. You know, we we know that Alderman's big job is is uh, 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 approving zoning changes. And that requires a community process, which I'm really excited about doing so with transparency and accountability. But it also means that, you know, I, I am really focused on making sure that when we're building new units, we want to prioritize affordability for families. We want to expand the affordability where possible. We want to build those units on site so we're not continuing to, you know, entrench segregation of the city. And so, that's something I'm thinking about as well as we're work as as my office works with developers to make sure that we're providing the necessary units. Because um, right now, um, what, what the figure that I've seen is that Chicago is going to be about 120,000 housing units behind schedule just this year, and that's far too many and creates far too many circumstances for um, for folks to be living in tents along the lakefront. When I, when I see one of the candidates, Andre Peliquin, has the background in real estate, I, immediately my mind goes to, oh, gentrification opportunity, the same way Kappelman did with his cronies 
uh, I think it, it's that Kappelman in the 49th ward, I believe. 46. 46. 46. Yeah. Ward. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I think that we need to have, personally, my opinion is we need to have an elder person representing the ward that is less connected with real estate ties and more focused on how do I, how do I figure out how to protect yeah. so many of the vulnerable people that don't have a voice that aren't connected with the money of the developers and, you know, all of the internal politics and cronyism that, that yeah. is associated with that. I want to open up, uh, unless uh, I don't, Kit and Ed, if you have any other questions, I do want to also see if there are any questions from our viewers in the live chat uh, before, uh, well, you know, we, we allow, ones. we take, we take the spotlight off of Nick, uh, the interrogation here. Um, Anybody in the live chat that wants to share some questions, please go ahead and type them. Kit and Ed, do you have any other follow-ups? Uh, my, well, my only follow-up would be, uh, what's your favorite style of Chicago pizza? And there is no wrong answer. It mm. seems like there probably is a wrong answer, but I'm going to go there with tavern style. style. I'm ta tavern style. Your tavern style. That's a good yeah, answer. Okay, yeah. very good. All right, yeah. my question. Yeah. My, my oh, question real quick. Okay. All right, this is the big one. Socks or cob? Oh, I'm going to get in so much trouble here. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's the uh -huh. thing. Uh -oh. I, am from, I am from suburban Detroit. But, okay. uh -huh. but, but, very important qualification. I am old enough to remember when the American League only had two divisions and the White Sox and the Tigers were not rivals in yeah. those divisions. The, the Tigers' rival was Cleveland and the Yankees and the Red Sox and the Blue Jays. I will also say, because she's sitting right across from me, my partner will be very mad if I don't say White Sox because she loves the White Sox. Brilliant! For Alderman on the north side of Brilliant! Chicago. Brilliant! Brilliant! Okay, we have an important question yes. from the live yeah. chat, and it's and it's a serious one. I've actually well like weighed in on this myself, and, and I'll, I'll share yeah. what I think after we ask Nick what he thinks. Um, can I can I submit this first though, Jerry? All right. Well, that, I, I've, I've taken Kathy's question off twice now, so go ahead. It, it is okay to support both baseball teams Thank in you. the city of Chicago. Thank you. Uh, when I was a youth of a much younger age, we we there wasn't this super polarized right north south rivalry like there exists today. And yeah. so my family would take me to the Cubs games and the Sox games. Same and we here. didn't have a problem with that. Yeah. And and our ambassador was Harry Carey in both locations. Yeah. That's true. So if well, Harry that, was okay with being in both locations, Harry was I think the rest of both. And I, I think up, the rest of the city can be. And I grew up uh watching Cubs games on WGN because my aunt uh, before there was a team in, in, in Phoenix, my aunt was a huge Cubs fan. Um, and so, like Steve Stone, you know, mm -hmm. like top Cubs and Sox, still yeah. listen to him, right? And so that, that's meaningful for me. Am I getting the Dibs question? Is that, is that you what are, you are? Yes, gonna you get, are. You are going to get the there. Dibs question. But I'm just going to so say mad. that be, if you are going to be the alderman of the 48th Ward, you are technically on the north side, and you're going to have to show some love to the Cubbies. Of course. <laughs> of course I have to show some love to the Cubbies. That doesn't mean you can't also still support the White Sox. Um, all right, yeah, so we got your right. you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, we all have opinions on this, actually, actually, very differing opinions. So, I mean, again, I think with this, I don't think there's a right or wrong, it's certainly very subjective to a person's uh thoughts on whether or not they feel shoveling out of space and allowing other people to use it is you know, sharing with the community, or if it really is your God given right to uh to hold on to something that you shovel out, even though it's a public street. So, Nick. How do you feel about dibs? Oh, look, I, 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 I'm going to be the most politician I could possibly be on this one. I, I think that I love the, uh, the history uh, and respect the lineage of Chicago that existed long before I arrived. <laughs> I think that um, if somebody goes through the trouble, if a, if a working class person shovels their car out of 12 feet of snow because they have to get to work and they work very, very long hours. I think they should be allowed to put a plastic cone in the street to uh, create, you know, some space for them to get back home. If they get back home late at night, what I do not support is when there's a half inch of snow and somebody does preemptive dibs, 
before they they get home. You know, like they have a family member do like a preemptive dibs for the preemptive. Very, very diplomatic. You are learning how to be a politician. Well done. <laughs> well done. Yeah. I well think that's indeed. I think that's one of the few questions that you can actually get a pass for for uh, doing a politician answer for. Okay, yeah. just because it's it that is a polarized issue as well, yeah. and a lot of it is just you know it just depends on uh, the rest of you and your neighbors on how you feel about that situation. Yeah. My whole because opinion, a lot of, yeah go ahead Ed. because a lot of time I mean you know if you're going to have like one of those overnights where you get like a foot of snow and all the neighbors come out to start shoveling out uh you know either the parking spaces or the back alley or whatever it should be a community effort there that these is are that. i think so yeah. the solution is everybody coming out and shoveling out a spot that way when you get back you don't yeah. have to say that's mine i i look at it this way nick for for what it's worth it's good exercise uh, once I'm gone, if somebody else needs that spot while I'm gone, they can have it because hopefully one of my neighbors will have also dug out a spot so that there's yeah. the entire street is dug out for everybody to just mm -hmm. a, a public street is all dug out so people can return and have a spot if they don't have a garage. But yeah. that's just and if opinion. you're able to, you know, dig out the spot next to you. Yeah, as well. Yeah. Especially if you've got a snowblower. I think that's right. Um, you know, more uh, look, the, the the another real answer and something that I'm interested in is creating more public community spaces, right? And and this is part of that, you know, coming out and helping out your neighbors and doing something together with people. It also makes, it also, you get to know your neighbors if you yes. don't already, you know, and that creates community safety too. Mm -hmm. So not to, not to always take it back to a platform piece, but I think that's part of it. And that's, that's what's really fun about this. My, so my neighbor to the North of me, whenever he does his lawn and he's got less of a lawn than I do in front, I'm in a two flat Without without me asking, he does my front lawn. I mean, he knows it's a little tough for me because I'm disabled. I've got a, I'm an amputee with a prosthetic limb, and I never ask him. And I'm, I buy him like a six pack of a Modelo, you know, because I appreciate it. And when winter comes, for some reason, it seems easier for me to get my snowblower out. I will do my sidewalk all the way to the alley for people who are coming from the grocery stores and to my neighbor to the north for helping me out in the summer with the lawnmower. So I do think that you know when you realize it, it, it's not just about ourselves; it's about helping each other. Uh, Cause I know there are some seniors who live on my street that I don't want to see slip on the ice. Yep. Um, and if I've got the snowblower and I can do it, I'm happy to get the exercise when I've got my, my limb on. Um, yeah. Let, let's think less about just serving ourselves and more about trying to figure out how to serve each other. Yeah. Well, this is, this was a great conversation. Yeah. It looks like you have some really uh, some dense topics to to get to here. I saw Ricky Hendon bribe on the, uh, we do. And I don't want to, yeah. oh, I am not weighing in on that one. Y'all. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have some fun with the future stories, but listen, yeah. tell uh, your aldermanic, uh, your, your, your uh, aldermanic candidate allies uh, that you are aligned with uh, to, to please uh, look at us and hopefully come on the show and join us as you have, because we do, we've got a few other candidates lined up. We're going to talk to, but cool. this is the fun part of the show is actually being able to present uh, the, the candidates and personalities that could make some change and provide the solutions uh, that we're bitching about all the time. Cause we're blue in the face with bitching about stuff. So it was a pleasure to, you know, look at your platform, your priorities on your website and be able to open up a conversation here and talk about it. Yeah, I'm really appreciative. This was very fun. And and thank you all for your questions and for all that you do. Just kind of activating, you know, space and time for, for us to come together and talk about these critical issues. So thanks so much. Thank you, Nick. Coming in again. Have a good rest of your night. You too. Take, Take care, care. And we will pay close attention to your campaign. Appreciate it. <laughs> well thanks done. Care, all right, gentlemen. That was good. Jerry, are you giving away my Modelo? Damn it. <laughs> <Is this> Modelo? <laughs> Damn it, I was looking for that the other night, and you're giving them away to some people I didn't even know. People taking uh, my Modelo. Sorry, Lori. <laughs> Gotta go. Lori, calm down. Just calm down. Just just calm down. Just calm down. You know, because we feed them, Ed. This is Nancy. I'm I'm Lori's friend, Nancy, drinker of the house. A little bit tipsy right now, but anyway. Hey, that I was that was refreshing. Project. It was nice to have a guest come on and, and share what, yeah. what his thoughts are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That Great show. Good. Yeah, I think I you know what? I'm thinking we should do we should have the dibs question for every candidate who comes on. I think it's a good question. 
It is. It's an important so, one. So thank you, Kathy Powers. So, uh, yeah, uh, thanks again, uh, Nick, for joining us. And uh, I wish him well with his campaign. We are going to be paying attention to all of the races and all of the awards. And I am very grateful he was uh, willing to come on and join us tonight. Now, in other news... Can I just share that early Thursday morning? Holy oh, shit. God. I remember this. What the fuck? Early Thursday morning, <laughs> I got an Instagram message personally from Mayol candidate Jamal Green, which made me feel very special because Jamal heard that we were laughing on Tuesday's show about Ricky Hendon's shit talking to Jamal in the previous uh, mayoral race. And and Jay Maul was very, very gracious enough to share these videos with me and said, yeah, this is breaking today. I just wanted to let you know about it. I'm like, obviously, we're not on the air in time, and I wouldn't want to you know, break it since his campaign. And, and uh, uh, Kevin Hobby, who is a friend of the show, uh, yeah, was on the on receiving the end of, of uh, Ricky Hendon's bribe attempt. But let's go to the video that I had the opportunity to see in advance before it was released on social media of what went down. Can you guys hear it? It's a little soft. It is. Can you make that any louder, Jerry? Uh, I've got it. I've got it up all the way on YouTube. Uh, but I, I, I'll, I'll share what in detail what he's saying here. I got a volume booster. If you, if, if uh, I could try and play the thing. Well, we're we're running it now, so let me. Okay. That's Ricky Hendon. Okay, we don't have to listen to anything. That's Ricky Hendon talking to Kevin Hobby, encouraging him to withdraw. The challenges against Willie Wilson's round table alleged roundtable petitioning, and the the questions about his residency within the city of Chicago, since he also has a residence in Hazelcrest. Now, I, let me let me share from um, from CBS News some of the details regarding this, as reported by uh, CBS News. Questions are arising about the campaign fund raising activities of former Illinois state senator and one-time alderman Ricky Hendon. As WBBM News Radio's Bob Conway reports, a Chicago Sun-Times report Monday said Tanya Cook, a former... Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong article. That's in relation to his previous activities as reported in 2012. Sorry, guys, I had the wrong article up. Let me go back to the current stories reported by Alice Yen at the Chicago Tribune. Uh, Mayor, mayoral candidate Willie Wilson says he doesn't condone bribes after challenger uh, J. Maul Green says volunteer was offered money to withdraw Wilson's petition uh, objection. Let me get the story up here. Sorry, guys. I'm juggling links and I had the wrong one, uh, the wrong news story up before I started sharing the story. But let me read from the article. Uh, the race for Chicago mayor took a turn towards the bazaar on Thursday as bickering between two candidates over petition challenges escalated into accusations that a high profile advisor offered money to the other campaign if it would drop its challenges. The claims of dirty politics grew after an Instagram account posted three video clips that purported to include the voice of former state Senator Ricky Hollywood Hendon, an aide to wealthy businessman, not campaign, not campaign manager, but aide to wealthy businessman, Willie Wilson's mayoral campaign, offering money to a staffer for candidate J. Maul Green if Green's campaign dropped its legal efforts challenging the validity of Wilson's petitions. Hours later, Wilson tried to distance himself from Hendon by releasing a statement saying, I do not, con I do not condone Rob and F. Holm, but his campaign acknowledged Hendon is still a paid advisor. <laughs> well, let's get this straight. <laughs> Hendon tried to bribe Kevin Hobby, and, but apparently he's still valuable enough to stay on Willie's campaign, even though Willie doesn't condone what Hollywood Hendon attempted to do. The skirmish was yeah. the latest between ambassadors yeah. for Wilson and That's Green, really the activist, 
Wilson and Green are two of 11 candidates running to become Chicago's next mayor in the wide open February 20th election. Among the first public fights Green and Wilson had this election cycle was Green's efforts earlier this week to get Wilson kicked off the ballot by having a campaign emissary formally object to Wilson's nominating signatures. Every campaign has uh, an ally that does this. Hendon challenged the signatures filed by Green and another candidate, Chicago Alderman Roderick Sawyer of the 6th, though Wilson has claimed he had nothing to do with Hendon's objections. Flash forward to Thursday when the Instagram account named Chicago Media Takeout posted the video clips with the caption, Willie Wilson's campaign manager, Ricky Hendon, trying to bribe a Green staffer to drop the legal challenge against Willie Wilson and to join their team. Hendon is not Wilson's campaign manager, but is a paid advisor. Wilson campaign spokesman uh, Richard Boykin said, Hendon does not appear in person in the video clips, right? But a male voice that is purportedly Hendon says over the phone to a man on the other end of the line, if you withdraw, I will take care of you. And you can tell me how much you would need. That person listening on speaker while wearing a green campaign shirt was identified later by Green's camp as campaign volunteer Kevin Hobby, who filed the objection to Wilson's signatures. Following the release of the clips, Wilson posted a statement on Twitter saying he didn't condone bribes, but that the comments made by former Senator Ricky Hendon were not authorized by me or my campaign. This is mm -hmm. a personal issue between Senator Hendon and Mr. Green. That he can still bandy around using that label senator is 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 just so laughable. Hendon did not respond to a request for comment. Green said in a statement Thursday that he was glad someone was able to capture the corrupt openness Ricky has. Quote, let me just say the old ways of politics is pulling some desperate moves to drag me and my campaign down, going so far as to offer financial compensation to my ally, Green wrote. The city's corrupt nature shows its face almost out in the open now. Almost. The sleazy deals, the open bribery, the big money talking, it needs to end. That's why I'm running for mayor in the first place. Green's campaign added, we want the proper authorities to investigate this matter further. In the clips, now, now in the clips, what's interesting, Hendon did identify himself. Uh, in the clips, the voice identified as Hendon says, Willie's going to make it. Jay Mall is not. We can work something out. Hobby, the man in the green shirt, responds, what are you offering? The voice on the line then says, well, you know, Everybody can use some help financially, so I would help you there before noting Wilson's personal wealth. The person on the line continues, if you withdraw, I will take care of you, and you can tell me how much you would need. You know, don't nobody wants you to lose money because J-Mall ain't going to be on the ballot, bro. The person speaking over the phone goes on to say he's had 25 people pouring over petitions for Green and Sawyer. I never miss, the voice says. As the mostly one-sided conversation continued, the voice that is supposedly Hendon's concludes... The people who call me about you, they'll tell you. Ricky Hendon keeps his word, whether it's good or bad, so I'm going to keep my word. So that's why I'm kicking j -Mall off, because I told him that. I guess he thought I was joking. I'm serious. Green and Hendon have a history dating back to the 2019 election when Green and Wilson were both running for mayor and Hendon challenged Green's petitions. That sparked what became a war of words on social media that uh, Kira quoted on Tuesday's show. So, gentlemen, um, it's the Chicago way – and he identified himself and well the aftermath of 2019 is still being seen in 2023 um you know i think jamal green unlike other progressive candidates learned his lesson when uh he was running in uh, in the previous election cycle and that is to be ready and strike at your known enemies look um willie wilson yeah, I, I interviewed him. Funny, funny interview. Great content, all that good stuff. But he's a clown. At the, en at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he is still a challenger. What Jamal Green is di did is challenge his petition signatures because Willie Wilson's campaign did the same thing to him in 2019. So it is to be expected. And in my opinion, and this goes for all the mayoral candidates, your goal is to win. Not just to make yourself a shiny star for one day, but your goal is to win and get the seat of the office of mayor of Chicago. So you want to tell all of your challengers you are not here to play games. You are here to win. Yeah, you can be kind and cordial to everyone. But at the end of the day, you want to get all the voters of Chicago to support you and you want to show strengths. And in order to show strengths, you must eliminate the competition. And Lightfoot is the real threat because, in my opinion, Lightfoot should not and must not be reelected 
in this election cycle. I don't think this city could survive another four years of her mismanagement. I think she's a failure of a mayor, and we need somebody new. Willie Wilson, he's not that person in my opinion. So if Jamal Green's going to try and take him out and challenge his position, so be it. And I and I have to say, if he is successful, then that means Jamal Green will get more attention to his campaign, hopefully on the south and west side and north sides of Chicago. Especially north. He needs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I love Jamal, but he's got to work his north game. Yep. His north side. Yeah. That's that's my criticism of him. Yeah. Great. He's a good game on the south and west side. But on the north side, he's got to win it too. You got to win all of Chicago. And if Jamal Green can successfully take out um, Willie Wilson, it's a sight to behold. But the, then again, too, you know, it, this this will be a cutthroat field. All the candidates need to show themselves that they are the proper successor for tw- for the twenty twenty three office of mayor of Chicago. And I just wanted to bring up uh, a little more about Ricky Hendon. Um, he oh, resigned yeah, an article from CBS up week. Yeah, go ahead. And I'll share from the article yeah, too. Let's, let's yeah, Ricky, Ricky resigned uh, from Senate in of uh, state Senate in uh, 2011. That was the previous okay. article. I unfortunately started before realizing I was reading the wrong article. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and, and I believe he was, he wasn't directly quoted, but it had been attributed that uh, to, I think another, uh, to an, an, an alderman at, uh, that was sit uh, a Chicago alderman at the time that he was done with politics. Now he's a political. So, hitman, so clearly, so clearly that was a lie. Yeah. And then a month after that, a story comes out that nine members of his staff were indicted for guess what? Bribery. Bribery. Whoa. What? Now, how is Whoa. this guy not in federal prison right now? Uh, very, very good question. You're not to prove of your methods. Yeah? Well, you're not from Chicago. Well, Sadly, like, the bad Chicago way. <laughs> he's gonna, uh, you're going to go along you know, having skated from federal charges yep. for 11 years. Let's talk about that a little bit, Ed. Let me share from the CBS article that I, I jumped uh, earlier. Uh, This was from 2012. Uh, As WBBM News Radio's Bob Conway reports, for some context, a Chicago Sun-Times report Monday said Tanya Cook, a former treasurer of the Chicago chapter of the National Black Nurses Association, told investigators that thousands of dollars in state grants intended for health care programs in minority neighborhoods was instead used to pay Hendon campaign workers and candidates whom Hendon supported. The paper notes that Hendon, who resigned from the state, Senate last year was instrumental in obtaining the grants. Cook and another Chicago nurse, Margaret A. Davis, were charged last year siphoning off $500,000 from state grant funds intended for Davis's personal use, the Sun-Times reported. Davis was program director for the National Black Nurse Association's Chicago chapter. Hendon's attorney declined comment to the Sun-Times, as did Davis's attorney. Hendon, who'd been the state Senate assistant majority leader, resigned in March of 2011. Alderman Walter Burnett of the 27th said at the time that Hendon was disappointed that his ally, Patricia Horton, did not win the race for city clerk and that he was done with politics altogether. Yes, Ed, why isn't this son of a bitch in jail? He should be in jail. My God. How could they not put the pieces together to put this guy behind bars so he wouldn't be the pimple on the ass of Chicago mayoral politics right now trying to bribe uh, on behalf of his candidates campaign workers of other campaigns. You know, I, I, uh, I've had the privilege of meeting Kevin Hobby. He's attended, a, he was at the Hard Lens Media open house we had uh, earlier this summer, and he came on the show and talked with Kira. Um, and the fact that he's uh, a, a part of uh, J-Mall's campaign and was quick to have somebody close by record that conversation. And by the way, I think, Ed, you loaded a better version of this. So let, let's, let's hear it in Ricky's words. You want to play it on that end? Sure. Let's see if this works for us here. And I ain't even gotta tell you, you know, the line, line, the lines. We both know y'all wasn't in there looking at them line by line. So Willie's gonna make it. The mall is not. Why you you have to suffer? We can work something out. You can come on our team or not. But I don't want to jam you, bro. I got people that know you. It's like these cool brothers that you didn't call. So that's why I'm calling. Okay. Well, uh, for real. What you what, what you what you what you offering? 
you what you offer? What you offer? What you offer? Well, you know, everybody um, can use some help financially. To the holidays. So I would help you there. That was the case. I mean, I could just go through the case. You know, Willie got money. He paid a lawyer. Don't pay the lawyer already. Wow. This is like listening to Nixon in the Watergate. You know, I, I know where we can get that kind of money. How much money do we need? I know how, much, how we can get that kind of money to pay people off. It's the same kind of tactics, man. And the fact that this guy's got a record siphoning grant money that didn't go where we're supposed to go to the Black Nurses Association. How's this guy walking the streets still? Who did he pay off? Who did he pay off to stay out of jail? You let me know what you're trying to do. I mean, I don't know. Oh, yeah, so, you know, if, if you withdraw, uh, I will take care of you. And you wow. can tell me how much you would need. You know, don't nobody want you to lose money. You know, but Jamal ain't going to be on the ballot, bro. I went through that shit. I had 25 people down there for a week. Sawyer ain't going to be on the ballot. I've never missed. Don't shoot I him. never miss like a sharpshooter. So, he's talking yeah. like a, a political assassin hitman is how he's talking. He's also super overconfident because j has <laughs> got a whole lot more ballot signatures than Sawyer does. Yep. They're well, desperate. What's going to happen with you? You know, you got a family, you know, kids and shit. They got to eat. Christmas coming up. They got to eat, man. So, Christmas coming up. And then, you know... <sighs> Or can look at the shotguns that they did on Willie because they hit they y'all hit every name on every page, you know, and and refer that shit over to the state's attorney. Who wants to do that? I don't want to do that to you. Right. No. This guy's a fucking um, gangster, man. So he is a gangster. Over, and then you let me know if it's something you're willing to do. So just think it over, and then you let me know if it's something you're willing to do. You know, you would have to, you know, uh, uh, file it. Yeah, Can you pause it for a like, second, Ed? It sounds like somebody edited. Well, there it was broken into three clips, and it sounds like they edited these three clips together. So yeah. there was a little bit of a hiccup. Let me also share this, okay? With all due respect to Dr. Wilson's business accomplishments, the fact that he doesn't toss this guy off his campaign, yeah, means that it, 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 he approves of it. Yeah, he's condoning. He, he, this. he claims he doesn't approve of it, but real disapproval would say you're gone. Because how does this make Willie Wilson look? And let's 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 be honest too. What is Willie Wilson used to doing to get votes? Bribe people with gas cards. He's a businessman, though, mm -hmm. right? They just pay well, everybody. This is this is con this is business just to them. Well, business see, as usual. See, we'll see. Hold we on. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, because here because here's the issue that I did bring up um, many months ago when Willie Wilson was doing this gas giveaway. It was only going to be temporary. He was earning the people's love at the point when they needed needed uh, gas for the car, right? But that's only temporarily. I mean, if he if he if he's not going to do that consistently for the people, it was all show. Yeah. So the thing we is now now the thing is what this tells me is the very fact that one of Willie Wilson's uh, people that he associates with operatives trying, operatives one of trying to reach out to Jamal Green's team to like hey get rid of this or we'll make your life uh, a hell. It tells me that there's a little bit of panic and instability in Willie Wilson's campaign, Definitely. that perhaps not yeah. everything is secure as it is. And that's been all been a facade. Cause you so wouldn't all, have to do that. Otherwise you would not have to lower yourself to this. Clearly you're right. Yeah. yeah. yeah and yeah. and that perhaps, and that perhaps in many ways, you know, maybe Willie Wilson isn't serious about running for mayor, but maybe on the other hand, what this is, is that, He's maybe trying to cover himself up so that if it's ever brought up again about giving gas away, you know, he could probably maybe make a cover because he because he what what I'm cons what, what what really raises some red flags is if you're confident in your petition signatures so much, you would not make a phone call to Jamal mm -hmm. Green's team. You would be all right. We got everything. Come and get us. You're going to be you're going to mm -hmm. look like the clown. So this tells me that maybe things are not as tight and locked up on the Willie Wilson campaign as he would want us to perceive. And I. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
And and I think Ricky is way more nervous about the residency challenge than he's letting on here. Yes, that's a big, you know, Rom was able to get away with that because uh, Burger King's wife was in the Supreme Court to, uh, oh, well, yeah, your wife, Amy, she had her bridal gown in the basement of the house in Ravenswood you're renting out. Yeah, you're still a resident here, even though you were living in Washington. But I don't think, yeah, Wilson doesn't have those doesn't have those connections. To, to say, oh, no, no, I, I, I would live in a city. Maybe I'll have residency in, in Hazelcrest. No, sorry. It jigs up with all that chicanery. Yeah, yeah it's just... Hanky. What does that mean, bitch? Hanky. Oh, strange. Weird. Well, let's just say strange or weird. I mean, hanky, that has no meaning. Well, we say hanky. I don't want you guys using words when I mean it got no meaning. <laughs> so, meanwhile, where's Lori? Well, no, she's just she's just on the can. She's in where's San Lori? She's, she's on the San can Francisco, taking a shit. She's in San Francisco. Yeah, she's she's on the can taking a shit. That's that's where she's at. Okay. She's in San Francisco. It's reported on Twitter by Gregory Pratt. Mayor Lightfoot is out in San Francisco fundraising. Because Not nobody in their right mind would give her money in Chicago. <laughs> Why are you in San fucking Francisco and not in the city? You know, uh, again, Jerry, you, <laughs> me, and Connor, we were there when the candidates were handing in their petition signatures. Willie Wilson was there. Jamal Green was there. Everyone was there except for who? The current incumbent, Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Now, when we interviewed a lot of the people there, what were they all saying? How odd and strange it is that on the first day, the incumbent isn't there. Now it was actually it was actually it was unprecedented, is what yeah. it was. So she's got. I mean, e either, either we we speculated on one of two possibilities. She didn't have enough signatures yet that she waited a week, or she didn't want to show up knowing how utterly reviled she is in that space with everyone else. Even although. The following week when she filed along with Garcia, who showed up the same day, we were wondering, is he going to have enough petition signatures, even though he announced very, very late in the race, although they had started collecting petitions for him early because of, you know, whatever Democratic uh, operations are in place there to either make sure that they retain control over Chicago if she loses with Chewy or Chewy acts as a spoiler uh, to, to basically dilute the votes of any of the more reputable and qualified candidates. Now... Greg Pratt reports reported on Twitter. And yeah, Ed, I love what you said, because no one here in their right minds would throw money away. Uh, Mayor Lightfoot is out in San Francisco fundraising, not the least bit of transparency from her campaign or the city about her travels. Quote, not the first time either. And uh, as, as, as tweeted by Josh Cohen, Mayor Bread, Mayor Breed and former Mayor Willie Brown hosting a fundraiser for Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot in San Francisco. Lightfoot called Brown one of the smartest political minds and credited Breed for shutting down San Francisco early in the pandemic. I said, what are you doing? This is some crazy shit. Wow. Um, so also seen on Twitter. Actually, that's the tweet from, from, from Cohn that I also uh, switched over to. So, yeah, you know, clearly... Um, Fundraise, what what San Francisco interests is she going to serve with all that money there? Probably uh, the same thing that she does with the rest of her mayoral administration. That is bringing people that do not live in Chicago. I mean, Jerry, since we've been doing this show, we have reported how Lightfoot has put into her office, put into her administration, people who don't even live in the city into key positions of power. Lightfoot has zero respect for Chicago, its history, its constituents, and its people. Lightfoot is a clown. While the city is burning, while the city is falling apart and facing so many disasters and numerous amounts of corruption, Lightfoot is out there playing costumes, acting like a clown, being thin-skinned, not taking criticism. She is the worst mayor in our city's history. She is an absolute fraud. And she doesn't care about the people. And she's doing everything she can to reaching out to probably outside special interest groups to carve up our city. Exactly. Hence, hence my point, if Lightfoot is reelected, <laughs> this city is going to be carved apart. This city is going to be bled dry by outside interests. 
people who don't care about Chicagoans, people who don't care about the generations that have been living here, people who don't care about the history of the city. Folks, if Lightfoot is reelected, it is the final death blow to this city. She cannot get reelected. She's got to go. Lightfoot 2020. What a fucking bitch. Am I right? <laughs> Lightfoot 2023. She's got to go. I'm so. Hey, look and look. If if I'm being too mean, uh, Mayor Lightfoot, come onto our show and explain your positions. Speaking of mayoral candidates, this was an interesting development. And you know what? I, admittedly, I didn't get a chance to dig too deep into this because it came across uh, my radar pre-show, but I did find this on Twitter. Now, I don't agree with everything that Chicago Contrarian posts on Twitter. They're 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 very extreme right wing, uh, you know, conservative tribal politics over there. But they did share. Look who stood in line with his handout for campaign cash from alleged fraudster, fraudster Samuel Bankman Fried, who's probably going to single-handedly uh, caused the collapse of the U.S. economic system with the uh, the, the fraudulent uh, transactions and disappearing cash at FTX. And Chewy sits on the House committee, which oversees the financial sector. Can we take that down for a second so we can see the graphic? Ed, thanks. Um, Representative Chewy Garcia's troubles are piling up. Will Chicago elect a mayor with ties to FTX? Big money spreads its tentacles everywhere and buys – uh, political favor everywhere. And with Chewy being a congressman receiving donations from SBF, one can only wonder uh, what kind of blind eye was turned away mm -hmm. from th the proper type of um, uh, what's what legislation or oversight that SBX uh, should have been under the microscope for. Yeah, there's a whole web of corruption going on in politics, and FTX has basically just exposed all of it at once. I don't even think it was intentional. It just happened. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that along with the fact that they just picked the wrong stock to, to mess with on in the stock exchange. Uh, you know, you don't mess. You don't mess with movie theaters, guys. Said, you do not mess with movie theaters. We're Don't saving that company, and there's nothing you can do to stop us. Agreed. <laughs> I'm queuing up our next story here. Um, all right. So, you know, I saw this story earlier this week and was really on the fence. Do I want to cover this? Because, you know, some might uh, think that my covering it means that I'm not an ally to the LGBTQ plus community. However, yeah, we, we um, I, I can't ignore this. Walk on eggshells for this. Well, movie, but, but do but, we? Yeah, but we but should we, cover it. Well, we should we should cover it though. All right. We're... So, I'm going to share what was reported by WGN here in Chicago regarding uh, the the uh where is it the uh, chicago hang on i gotta open up the article here so i get the names right because i'm already like you know dealing with old timers as far as remembering names and stuff so give me a moment here it was parker uh private parker school here in chicago oh francis parker yeah yeah francis yeah parker, right did you right. follow this did you see this story uh kid well well actually I, I i got i got a little funny story i got a little funny story okay. about francis parker all right well so, let's uh, go ahead so the thing is, when I was in high school, my uh, I think it's my junior year. Yeah, me and my junior or senior year, they actually transferred some of us to go over there. It was like a, a program for South Side kids to be up on the north side to go to a school up there. I, again, it was a little complicated, but I just found it interesting. Uh, that school was like night and day compared to my school that I went to on the south side. In what way? I'm, I mean, holy shit. Shit, they had a lot of stuff. I mean, as a South Side kid, I mean, they had the latest computers. Well, it's a private school, so clean. they can afford it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, everything looked nice. I mean, they had gourmet food. I mean, okay, not gourmet food, but I mean, like, like not the typical food that you get on the South Side of Chicago. I mean, for the Chicago public schools. I mean, let's let's face it, tuition. I saw what the tuition rate is. It's like forty k or a little bit above that. 
Yeah. That place, I, I remember when my grandpa would drop me off there, and this is me in my junior or senior year, uh, he would say, oh, my God, I always see street sweepers here. How come they don't clean? My, like, and my grandpa, like, he's 96, but, you know, b- back in the day, this was like, what, 2003, 2002? He would always say this when he was dropping me off there. Why do I see so many people cleaning up this whole area? And that was that is an affluent area, a very rich school. So you're talking about experience night and day. I've 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 to this day that will always stay with me. Just that's when I kind of woke up in my head, like, oh, there's a lot of stuff on the north side that we don't get on the south side. Well, it's well, not just it's, it's not just that. It's no. it's also a difference between public school funding and private or charter exactly. school funding. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a big controversy regarding Joseph Bruno, the Dean of Students. Let's hear WGN report on the school's perception of what happened before we actually go to the video. And I'll, and I'll, you know, well, let me just be upfront here and say, I'm no fan of Project Veritas. Okay. Um, But we cannot dismiss the video that they, they recorded without uh, the Dean Joseph Bruno's uh, knowledge that edited it strings together salient points. I don't think that it misrepresents what Joseph Bruno was sharing in the privately recorded video. But let me go to, to WGN's coverage here first, and, and then we'll get into it. And then we'll then we'll do our deep dive. At a leap private school in Chicago is facing online criticism after a dean was apparently recorded by a right-wing activist group talking about the school. They are, but it doesn't mean we can dismiss the veracity of what they actually recorded. Sexy yeah. Programming. Francis Parker School in Lincoln Park is the latest target of Project Veritas. One of its contributors recorded a video that appears to show the school dean saying sex toys were shown to students as part of a discussion. Appears to? No, it's what it shows. That's what he says, and we'll show that video. The school released a statement saying Parker's Board of Trustees supports the inclusivity of its curriculum. That's great. Inclusivity is great. Giving sex toys to 14-year-old kids. A school spokesperson said he was filmed without his knowledge or permission while describing one example of our inclusive LGBTQ plus affirming and comprehensive approach to sex education. Project Veritas uh, uh, is deceptively, deceptively edited video with malicious intent. Now, again, I know that Project Veritas has an agenda. Facing online okay, hold, wait a second. Was apparently recorded. Sorry, it, it resumed. Now, I understand that Project Veritas is a right-wing hit job website, okay? And, and that's why I'm, I'm no fan of theirs. However, um, the video that was indeed recorded uh, in regards to what the dean shared is, in my opinion, kind of damning. But let me pull the video up. Let me see if I've got the right video to share without worrying about having buffering issues here. Uh, and if you guys want to speak up here while I get this prepared, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, the, I guess the one thing I would be wor- concerned about is whether he's talking about something in the context of sex education. And if, it, and if it's one of those things where parents have approved ahead of time that kids can be given this type of education, I think uh, the question becomes... 14 year old where, where let me get to my point um it, the Joe question Bruno. becomes at Hi what there. at what level is it are are you not using proper judgment in what exactly you're educating I had like our LGBT here. and i'm sorry Ed, i didn't concept, mean to and before, can you repeat that you, yeah repeat the, that the, the question is what what exactly where is the line in in judgment for what for what you would be educating in a sex education class. And should that line maybe be not to be overly explicit in the types of uh, sexuality that people are going to have regardless of your orientation? Okay, well, apparently this, to me, this has nothing to do with orientation, Ed, because you know what? If a straight teacher were bringing out yeah. dildos and butt yeah. plugs in a class of 14-year-olds, I'd say it was grooming just as much okay. as it, this guy. Okay, so let's hear it from his, his his own words, because you know what? He he says himself he did not run. Here, I'll, in his own words, let's share. 
I had like our LGBTQ plus health center come in. They were passing around butt plugs and dildos to my students. Here come the sex bots. Sex, using blue versus using spit. Meet Joe Bruno, Dean of Students at the prestigious Francis W. Parker Private School in Chicago, which happens to charge $40,000 per student. And they're just like passing around dildos, butt plugs. The kids are just playing with them. They're like, how do you, how does this butt plug work? How do we do like, how does this work? That's a really like blue part of my job. Parents might be stunned to learn that Bruno's version of love and acceptance means handing out sex toys to underage students. So I've been the dean for four years. During Pride, we do a Pride week every year. And I had um, I had like our LGBTQ plus health center come in. They were passing around butt plugs and dildos to my students, talking about queer sex, using blue versus using spit. Who is this? This is uh, an LGBTQ plus health center came in to talk to my high school students. They're just like passing around dildos, butt plugs. The kids are just yeah, pointing they, looking they at They shouldn't be doing that. In, in a class. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm sitting there. Then we had a drag queen come in, um, pass out cookies and brownies and do photos. And, so amazing. and everybody's Jerry, can you pause it for a second? The dildos. Nobody complains. Jerry? I mean, if the parents found out, but they... You're frozen, out. Jerry? Queer sex. I'm sorry. Did you ask me to pause it? Yeah. <laughs> can yeah, I... Can okay. I l let me finish out the video, though, because you need to hear the next part. The drag queen that came in. What's her name? Uh, Alexis Not this part, Bevels. but wait. Alexis Bevels. And just hung out in my classroom. And was there? Or hung out in my office. You have so much freedom. So much wiggle room. So much freedom. So much money. I mean, I mean to do things. stuff. Trustees are okay with that too? Oh, yeah. oh, they don't know. Yeah. They would. It's like, we. I wouldn't even like run it by them. Like, why would I run it by them? They'd be like... Why would I run it by him, Ed? Go ahead. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to do is say that I think it's it's really a, a bad thing to conflate drag queen type uh, experiences with the sexual toys and the LGBTQ health stuff. Because it, it's like these are two completely different subjects that they're just kind of mashing together in order to basically – make the entire thing taboo i don't think i would have a problem with drag queens as long as parents had you know prior approval to that kind of situation yeah that's the a big question the, yeah, when he yeah, says yeah, he yeah, didn't yeah, run it by the trustees though right he says no, himself i'm not i wonder I'm not if the getting, parents knew before we get into that jerry i just wanted to point out that i think that there are two different subjects happening there before he gets into the you know he, he can do it basically anything he wants thing which it's like you you this this dean clearly has a lack of judgment when it comes to lgbtq issues and what is appropriate to show youth and and yeah so it definitely going to be interpreted as grooming on some levels or you know depending on your perspective and how it's presented and who and whether parents approved of it and whether uh, and, and, you know, whether, whether he knowingly realizes it's grooming or whether the people coming in are, are doing their own grooming, uh, and there's a lot of questions question. going on. Let me on ask here. you a question. I, well, I'll, I'll, let me frame this first. Okay. I would opine or share that I think sex education and reproductive health within the context of trying to educate kids so that they don't get pregnant because they're naturally going to have hormonal urges at that age makes sense. Mm -hmm. Presenting all this stuff on uh, sex toys and yeah. gender identity questions with drag queens. I, I I'm not, I, look, I, 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 I'm not judging it, but when we talk about kids at a certain age, their minds are not fully developed and you've got beyond the reproductive health yeah. issue. Okay. To be able to prevent unwanted pregnancy and at least take some modicum of, of of um of common sense because obviously men and women boys and girls procreate to me that's what sex education in a classroom should go as far as doing all of this other stuff it's again if it was a heterosexual teacher 
who decided to bring in dildos and sex dolls and, you know, whether it's, you know, hey, girls, here's a dildo that you can play with. Or, here, hey, boys, uh, you know, here's a, 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 what are they, the, yeah. the, the okay. That's, that, to me, that's basically, to, in my mind, making all this stuff acceptable to kids, whereas adults can be around it. And come on, Ed, we've seen all the sexual scandals in a lot of our Chicago schools that have been looked past heterosexual scandals that are completely unacceptable that this stuff. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I label it as grooming and I don't care that he's, yeah. he's gay. It's not about his lifestyle choice. And you know what also had, I could care less what he is or what he does behind his own closed doors, but this level of exposure to middle school kids, whether it's a private school or not, I just think is like going beyond the boundaries, especially when he says, Oh no, I don't have to tell the trustees. You don't okay. have to tell the trustees. Do the parents know then? Okay. So, so here's something I want to add in here too. Look, um, this is a private school. The trustees, parents need to know what's going on. The fact that there's been a lot of a big hands-off approach tells me that there is a lack of accountability, not only in this area, but in other areas of Francis Parker that we don't know about. Now, mm -hmm. again, when I was there, part of this transfer program, again, a long time ago, right? Um, that school, like I said, night and day. They have access to a lot of resources. It's a private school. Um, it's up there on the north side. The fact that many people were like this and chose not to inform the trustees, parents, etc. Um, from from not, not, not only is it problematic, but it tells me from top to bottom throughout the entire infrastructure of Francis Parker, everyone needs to start opening the books and start finding out what exactly is going on there because it's not only just this controversial issue but i'm wondering well, what else is happening there that we don't know about Agreed. okay and it requires again inquisitive minds to start asking very hard and tough questions the entire administrative staff and people who run francis parker parents trustees and everyone else uh, needs to open up the books because now, yeah it's it's it, it cuz again i have to wonder the fact that so he's talking about so much money was given to this to what he was about to do okay what else is there what else is happening now to be fair i would like to see the complete unedited video of this yep. conversation yeah. now because, but because, that wait, said though yeah. kid that yeah. being said there was a long stretch there uninterrupted of this guy basically yeah. posting and bragging about what they're doing there without any oversight. So that's right, not yeah. edited and, and, and that's and, and, not a manipulated message. That's that, that's true. So here's yeah. the thing. Again, this is Project Veritas, right? Yeah. And in their rare moments, a broken clock can be right twice a day. I know. Yeah. I know. They have been exactly. correct on certain other issues, especially when they have been wrongly uncensored and a few other things mm -hmm. in between. But again, this is Project Veritas. So what I would like to see, and I think all of us would like to see, is a full unedited video seen in its full entirety. Mm -hmm. But to your point, there he is talking about all this unedited. And what I want to ask again is when he's talking about the amount of money that he had access to, I want to look at the bigger picture. What's happening with the entire economic in infrastructure at Francis Parker and what people also, what, what, and I hope we do talk about this, their social media, because on Twitter, Francis Parker did delete its Twitter account. They did immediately because oh, they didn't want to deal with the controversy. Now to that point also, um, Kit, uh, yeah, if this is what's allowed to go on without anybody knowing about it, with all of the scandals across other public schools and middle schools, how do we know that maybe there aren't heterosexual teachers taking advantage of their situation there to groom kids? This is not about mm -hmm. sexual preference. This is about what is appropriate amongst middle schoolers as far as education goes. Mm -hmm. Logical, preventative education regarding reproductive health, it has to be taught. This stuff is a lot of folly. So this guy O'Keefe went back there and it's just, it's just funny the way he, okay. So this video is edited in a funny way. You know, I I've, I've edited some funny videos here at Chicago corner regarding mayor Lightfoot. So let's look past the, um, the irreverence of this video, but also we're going to review how the school responded to this particular encounter. Joe Bruno. Yeah. Hi there. <laughs> Um, James O'Keefe with Project Veritas. Hell no, to the no, no, no. Oh, God. On camera here. 
talking about giving anal sex toys and butt plugs to little children. They're just like passing on dildos and butt plugs. The kids are just playing with them. Sir, why are you running? Why are you running away? Why are you running? Sir, anal butt plugs and toys? <laughs> Dude, there's kids right there. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's um, inappropriate. Teacher is in. Come on, man. Not as inappropriate as distributing that stuff amongst classmates, though. I know, I know, I know. But see, as yeah, a reporter, as a reporter, as a reporter, you gotta have some mom decor. Right. right, but he was giving sex toys to the children. I have children here. Don't you think? Please give that. We're leaving. Um, but he was he was talking about giving sex toys to children. We understand we're reporters asking someone a question. We are leaving. You bet. As you can see, he ran into the building as quickly as possible. Are we allowed to step? If all this was okay, why wouldn't you set the record straight, guys? If you have an opportunity, yeah, yeah O'Keefe is an asshole. I, I'm, yeah. I'm not defending or condoning O'Keefe. Yeah. But if you really were in the right here and had a reasonable explanation, why wouldn't you say, hey, yeah, I, you know, you recorded me. Uh, I didn't know it, and let me clarify what I said. The guy's running off like like a, like a cockroach with the light shined onto him. Let me continue. Stand on the sidewalk, sir. Thank you. We're going to stand on the sidewalk right here. Um, are you, do you know a Joseph Bruno? Bruno? Bueller? Bueller? Yes, you're filming me. We're filming you, too. Joe Bruno, your dean of students, talking about giving sex toys to children. Okay. Let's not sweep this under the rug like that fashion company, which said, well, yeah. I think it was Jimmy who covered uh, the, the hosts of The View who were more critical about Balencia. Balencia? How do you pronounce that fashion company? I think it's Balencia. Balencia. Uh, okay. It's Using Balenciaga. Balenciaga. Okay, Balenciaga. Using kids in questionable sexual situations to promote their product line, which was unacceptable. Yeah. And Jimmy talked about this too. The women on The View were more critical of the product line than of and making excuses for mm -hmm. the producers or management at Balenciaga. So here's how, uh, here's how the school responded to ab after removing their Twitter account. Here's what they shared with the community and that video that we just shared. A message to the community regarding an incident this evening. We're writing to let you know that one of our employees while at a conference last week was targeted by a right-wing fringe group of individuals. What if they were a left-wing fringe group? Would it matter? Uh, to me, that is, that is, that is smokescreen. Okay, that's political smokescreen that seeks to undermine and manipulate diversity, equality, inclusion, and belonging work in schools. No, it's not. Okay, diversity, yeah. equity, inclusion, and belonging has nothing to do with giving butt plugs and other. We're going to get the sex spots in the chat here, but seriously, okay, I'm all for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, but not at the point where you're engaging in instructional activity that I think, again, this is my opinion here, guys, and we can talk about this. Is, is is borderline grooming. This evening, the group showed up outside the school and attempted to confront and ambush this employee with aggressive questions. Were they aggressive questions? Uh, a handful they of students- They were just loud members, questions. Yeah, a handful of students and family members were present. This incident is very upsetting and we stand in full support of our employee, not uh -huh. the kids. We have our uh -huh. additional security measures in place and we will notify the community should there be any additional activity from this group regarding the school on our employee. We advise members of our community not to engage with any organization that fits this general profile. And lastly, yeah, in support of our curriculum students and employees, at Parker, we care deeply about the health, well-being, and development of our students. Yes, of course they should. Our programs are designed to help cultivate not only physical and emotional well-being, but also a strong sense of belonging. This is central to our mission. I'm sorry, how do butt plugs and, and sex toys uh, promote a strong sense of belonging in a sex education class? That's why we are heartbroken to learn that one, this is their words, guys. I'm not making this shit up. This is why we're heartbroken to learn that one of our colleagues' words have been severely misrepresented for a malicious purpose. What? Project Veritas is a far right wing activist group. Yeah. 
that produces deceptively edited videos of secret recordings in an effort to discredit mainstream media, organizations, progressive groups, and educational institutions. Did they? Last uh, week. They do that, but in this case. Okay. They're not. Last week. At a National Association of Independent Schools People of Color conference, one of our employees was targeted by this group and misled to believe he was conversing with another conference attendee over a coffee. He was filmed without his knowledge or permission, yeah, mm -hmm. while describing one example of inclusive LGBTQ plus affirming and comprehensive approach to sex education. No, sorry, that's not a comprehensive approach. Uh, the way that this guy described it. This group has now edited this video with malicious intent and launched it publicly tonight. Please know this video contains descriptive language if you choose to view it. We ask you not to share it because it will add to its viral power. It's what? already out there, you grooming, geniuses. Grooming it's, students, it's grooming mis, middle school kids. Yeah, it's a misguided approach is what it is. Uh, You're being kind, Ed. All right, I'm, lastly. Go ahead, Jer Jerry. I'm agreeing with you. Okay. But what it's I not about it. I don't want you to agree with me, Ed. I'm just saying. I think no, that in the effort it's to not like about what you want, Jerry, I'm agreeing with you. Okay. <laughs> I'm saying it's just about right or wrong. Jerry, 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 let 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 Edward speak. Can I, let Edward okay. can, I, can I get a word? Okay. Um, I'm saying you you are correct that that they should have a ba the basic level of education and this. And this goes above and beyond anything they should be teaching in a school curriculum. This is these are these are the types of experiences that adults should have to explore on their own once they've already received that basic education, which this should not be included in. And the school in my is opinion. excusing it. Thank you. I agree with you. My concern here. Let's go beyond the secret video. Let's go beyond the politics. The school is making excuses for the teacher instead of being concerned about how this actually impacts the well-being of the middle school students. I don't have kids, guys, but I do have uh, 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 six nephews, seven nephews and a niece mm -hmm. of varying ages from uh, seven through 21. I'm not as worried about the older ones. They're off to college now. The younger ones. I saw uh, a video that was produced in my one of my younger nephews' middle school. They do a video newscast, and I was kind of like, shocked honestly that he is nine ten years old and they have an lb lgbtq plus pride club in middle school and i'm like how does that belong yeah we want to teach inclusion we want to teach acceptance to have a club in a school for eight and seven year old or eight to ten year olds how is that not potentially fostering acceptance that could confuse kids whether they are, whether they have figured out their identities or not, guys, I'm I'm not anti mm -hmm. it, I you know, but me even I think that's a up, different issue. I think that's like a I'm different. Critic. I think that is a different issue. That I think that's a different, a different issue, Jerry. Oh, it's a different so, yeah. issue from this. But I'm saying, from my perception, it seems that this is a major agenda and programming now in schools. And this this example at this school at Parker takes it to the absolute extreme. I'm 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 accepting of what happened in my nephew's high school to a degree you know my sister and her husband can handle that it's none of my business but to me this is the extreme that it seems to open the doors to guys and i and i'm it, it concerns me especially in context with other stories we've reported on of gross abuses sexual abuses in public schools committed by heterosexual teachers okay so abused, okay so so looking at this letter reading its full entirety we have it up here uh, I'm going to bring up my original point. Obviously, um, the individual who is running that program has access to a lot of resources and money. Uh, Hands-off approach. Didn't need to inform the trustees, parents, etc. Let's look at the bigger picture. To the people who go to Francis Parker, people have uh, you know kids who go there. I think it's fair enough for a community and for the trustees to start opening the books and start wondering what else of abuses of power is happening there yeah. because let's say let's say let's say let's say just for a point of order there is no abuse no one's being hurt in that one thing that, that was brought up by project veritas what else is being overlooked what else of abuses of power are we not seeing what other crimes are not being addressed what other yeah i know shenanigans are taking place there because francis parker it's up there on the north side it's a very nice, affluent, safe area of Chicago, okay? Yes, Fox News, there are safe areas in Chicago. Francis Parker is up there. And behind that facade, 
a lot of dark things can go unnoticed everywhere. So, so, That's so, the scary so, yeah, thing. I, I, know, I know, I know everywhere, but see Francis Parker <clears throat> is one of these again, very affluent area. I think it's time for people to start checking underneath the rocks, crevices and everywhere else about how that entire school is being run top to bottom. I just think it's, you can agree with me or not. I think it's predatory. I, I, I'm not saying that this teacher engaged in any um, questionable behavior beyond what I think is completely inappropriate, passing that stuff around and talking so brazenly about it. Like it, you know, there's no potential downside to exposing young kids to stuff that they might not really understand, especially as it relates to their sexuality. Yeah. Um, th that that's, but you know, when, when we hear, as you mentioned, Kit, all these dark stories, nobody had any imagine any inkling to what kind of crap was happening with Jeffrey Epstein or other, other yeah. organizations that literally it's like under light of day now think that this stuff is okay. And I question if there's a grooming aspect to it. Which is which is and, really really frightening. And it's, uh, a, and it's, it's an uncle I, and and it's yeah. any ki anybody's kids. I so think, then, okay, I think open up the books. Open up the yeah. books of how Francis Parker is being run. It's time yeah. for the parents and the board of trustees to start looking how Francis Parker is being run. Okay, if this it let this be the straw that breaks the camel's back. If you if you're a parent. Your kid's going to Francis Parker. If you're part of the board of trustees, if you're a donor to Francis Parker, and yes, this is a very rich school. It's in a very affluent area. But the fact that there's been this big hands-off approach, I have to wonder what else is being ignored. I'm going to repeat myself mm -hmm. again. What else is being ignored? What else is being covered up? What else of abuses of power are we not seeing here? Because there's probably a bigger picture of how the entire infrastructure of Francis Parker is being run. And if people decide to start, I don't know, checking out how the how the entire system is run, there's going to be a lot of red flags raised. And I think it's long overdue that some accountability is stuck in place. OK, so it's time for people to start doing their jobs and start seeing how Francis Parker is being run. Simple as that. And this isn't being anti anything. Yes. Thank but you. There, but this, there, hold on. This isn't being anti anything. This is now. OK. I'm now I'm not a parent, but to the parents there, they have a right now to start asking, how is this school being run? You're taking forty thousand dollars from me so that my kid can go to this very elite school. And Francis Parker is an elite school. Time to start checking how things are run. If there's been a hands off approach, how long has there been a hands off approach? This is an anti anything. It's because this is for the safety and well-being uh, well of all these kids. Make it happen. Yeah, if I'm anybody seeing, takes – oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm seeing uh, – I don't know. I, I just kind of see that there's uh, – in, in, in certain perspectives where uh, your default is to be non-judgmental, it seems like sometimes you're, there's a lack of judgment if you get my meaning. Yeah, and, and so I it, also it's like when they get to an extreme level of of being non judgmental, and then not realizing that wait maybe we should have a few a few lines in the sand we should we should draw the line you. at this. Anybody and that's thinks, what I'm seeing. Anybody who thinks my commentary or analysis or interest in this story has anything to do with judging LGBTQ plus lifestyle, you're out of your mind. I'm no. not judging it. I could no. care less. I, 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 I know some people in my life. Uh, I have no judgments over uh, choice, lifestyle choices or, or affirmations regarding their truth. My, and that's why I brought up the story. It's like we cannot ignore, though, in, in supporting inclusion and acceptance of that particular, if you want to, however you want to define it as a lifestyle. When it comes to like middle school kids here, yeah, there, there's a severe lack of judgment in embracing the inclusion and how it could potentially damage or open up a, a, a Pandora's box of of maybe in, unintentionally grooming children. Mm -hmm. That's my concern. And, and look, and look, the thing is, uh, another question I have is how long has that program been run for? How long has the school known about it? Did parents know about it? Because there has to be bounds of reason here, okay? This isn't being anti... And again, it's not being anti-anything. 
This is just, again, asking a serious question. How long has this been going on with nobody knowing how things are running uh, at Francis Parker? Okay, and um, obviously another red flag for me is the fact that Francis Parker, a very elite school in Chicago, decided to delete its Twitter account. That's the You idea. don't do that. That's right. Especially in the midst of a scandal, because what that it, says to me then guilty. As an, is that either one, you have people here who have no idea how to run social media or number two, like what Jerry says, guilty or, or three, perhaps maybe somebody found out something like, oh, my God, there's no way we can answer all these questions because it's it's again, it's going to blow up. So uh, Francis Parker Delina's Twitter account. Not good. That's not good. <laughs> You remember the Kryptonian Council in the first Superman with Christopher Reeve guys? Guilty, guilty. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. When, when when they sent Zod and his followers into the uh, Phantom yeah. Zone, yeah, who committed crimes against children. Actually, that was part of the reason that they were they were banished to the Phantom Zone. Uh, I think it was Ursa who committed all kinds of horrible, heinous crimes against. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. yeah, 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 no, no. Those three were war criminals. Yep, straight up. Yeah. Straight up, they were war criminals. They, yeah, Zod is not good. Zod is an evil, evil, evil Kryptonian. But, I want to okay, thank back on point. Back on for point. the super sticker. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. I mean, again, there's a reverence coming up, but you know what? I'm not a Rahm Emanuel. I'm not Rahm Emanuel, and how he routinely threw out this phrase to like ignore all the bad shit he was involved in. But I, I really do mean this genuinely. This really is about the children, in my opinion, and like examining this and trying to figure out what the fuck was going on over there. Yeah. And again, check how the entire administration was being run, how the entire school is being run. Yeah. Um, Along with uh, all the schools, private yeah. and public, that we're discovering all this horrible predatory shit against middle school or any – any. This there's no place in schools for this. Grade school, middle school, high school. There's no place for it, for yeah. teachers to be engaging in behavior that they're grooming or they are you know, shaping minds in a way that parents don't know about that can be potentially harmful to the kids – uh, well-being and development. That's all I'm saying. All right, let's move on from that. Uh, Ed, you have something queued up, but I'm not sure is that in regard to the story yeah. or something in the future. Yeah, it's this is just a really quick update for anybody who's looking in this, who's in the city of Chicago looking for cash assistance. Oh, I was just uh, uh, hold on. I'm I'm getting okay. to that story. <laughs> okay. Um. We're covering it. It's in the show notes. I mean, we can pop that up, but let me read from the actual uh, from the actual MSN article so people can get the details, and then we can pop up yeah. that graphic. All right, so I'll pop up the graphic while I read from MSN. Thanks for queuing that up, Ed. Mm -hmm. All right, so as reported by Alyssa Kaufman, uh, CBS Chicago, the deadline is tonight uh, for Chicago's Resiliency 2.0 Cash Assistance Program. If you want to apply for round two of the city's resiliency 2.0 cash assistance program, you have until 11.59 p.m., which is several hours away. The program provides $500 in cash payments to over 4,000 Chicagoans in need. It is another means-tested program. It's aimed at helping people who may have been left out of the COVID-19 stimulus, particularly caregivers of adults or households with adult children. You can apply going to chicash.org. And Ed has graciously shared the link there in the chat. Thank you, yeah. Ed. Get that money if you can. You know, I mean, yeah, they say they put a few hurdles in there and you got to, you know, you got to have a dependent who's 17 or older. But there's a number of you out there who are in this situation. And if you're watching tonight, you got a few hours left to apply for this thing. Uh, you know, get that money. So wait, wait. Can you can you uh, uh, elaborate more? Does that also take? Uh, does that uh, who does that include? Like people even taking care of senior citizens or not? Yes, I think so, Kit. You should look yeah. into it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, let me share something here with our viewing audience. One of the many things I admire uh, regarding my colleague Kit here is his dedication and commitment to taking care of his grandfather. And I know you face a lot of challenges with that, buddy. So I mean, if there's an opportunity here to get some assistance for your efforts caring for your grandpa, go for it. Yeah. If you claim him as, as a dependent on your taxes, then yeah, you qualify for this. Uh, okay. All right. I'll have to look into that because I know he's, he's, he still take care of himself. I mean, I just keep an eye on him. So there you go. No, you do a lot. I know you, you, it's okay to be humble about it, but we know you do a lot and it's, it, it says a lot about your character. 
I, that's five hundred dollars. That's you know that's I'm, that's I'm, no yeah that's nothing to sneeze at. You no, know, if you can no, no. if you can get that money, if you can qualify, you know absolutely. You yeah. So also on our radar, uh, this came up today uh, on Block Club Chicago. Uh, thank you, Ed, for sharing. I did reach out to the author because, ironically, I shared our press release regarding our toy drive early this morning. Uh, and ironically, Block Club Chicago had a list to share of other uh, toy drives and, and food drives and stuff to uh, collect items for Chicago's neediest. So I do want to share, though, what Block Club Chicago shared in the hopes that they can update this page with our event on the 23rd. Uh, this came to us came to us by uh, Kaylee Padar. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Holiday toy drives are collecting gifts for Chicago families in need. It's good for people to see that somebody cares. Here's how you can spread cheer to families who are struggling right now. I would encourage everybody to participate wherever they can, but also make sure to participate in ours on the 23rd because it's our first effort out and we hope it's a big success. The holiday season can be a challenging time for many families, but Chicagoans are already working to brighten people's spirits by collecting gifts and clothing for neighbors in need. The owners of Wicker Park's Helen Dora Samuels Picture Framing at 1736 West North Avenue have been spreading the love for the past five years by distributing toys and winter clothing to families in Austin through their annual holiday drive. I love to see the joy in the children's faces, the moms looking like they finally found a little relief, that they don't have to struggle and get a whole lot of stuff since they've already got a few things, co-owner Helen Dora Samuels said. There they are with Santa Claus. Samuels said she understands how difficult the holiday season can be after growing up in a single-parent household and raising her three sons on her own. I feel like we've I've got to go back and help the Austin neighborhood because it's the village that raised me, Samuels said. Now, the Block Club Chicago article rounded up holiday drives throughout Chicago, collecting gifts and other supplies. This is not an exhaustive list, and it will be updated to reflect the many holiday toy drives happening across the city this month. Great. So maybe we got a shot at like getting ours included there. So they do go on to identify uh, collection drives in Auburn Gresham, Austin, Bronzeville, Chatham, East Garfield Park, uh, Edgewater, the far northwest side, Lakeview, North Center, Rogers Park, Roseland, Uptown, and Wicker Park. Now ours is going to be taking place in Portage Park at the Patio Theater. I do want to share that we do have our event uh, up on the Chicago Reader as well as Facebook events. But I'm going to bring up the Chicago Reader uh, link that is also in our show notes below. So hopefully everybody can mark their calendars. And by the way, you are going to get in uh, for free. There is no admission now uh, for anybody that brings a shelf-stable canned food donation or mm. a new and unwrapped toy. Gets you admission to watch uh, my film, Solstice, along with uh, Home Alone on a double bill. So here's our event as listed at the reader. And it is now identified as free. So uh, let me zoom that in. Will it open up? Please help out if you can, folks. Yeah, help us help others. That's the whole point of the night. Kit's going to be there as the MC for the show. We're going to have a sing-along ahead of time at the patio theater. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and you know, while I'm at it, why don't I do some shameless self promotion and run our video since we're close to the, the show. Hey everybody. It's the crew of Chicago corner and hard lens media. I'm Jerry. I'm Kira. I'm Kit and Ed. Be sure to join your crew at Chicago Corner and Hard Lens Media for our first annual food and toy drive at Patio Theater, that's 6008 Irving Park Road on December 23rd, starting at 5.30 p.m. Folks, this is a big event. It's our first time ever food and toy drive. We will be collecting shelf-stable canned food and new unwrapped toys to pass along to the Greater Chicago Food Depository and the Chai Gives Back Chicagoland Toy Drive. This is a chance to do good for the people living here in the city of Chicago. Plus, it's the holiday spirit. So if you don't got it, get it. And if you don't get it, go figure it out. We begin our live stream here in the lobby at 5.30 p.m. We will be greeting all of you good people that bring us canned food and toy donations. Make sure to warm up your vocal cords because we start with a sing-along. Solstice at 7, Home Alone at 8. All you got to do for half-off admission to the show is bring shelf-stable canned food or a toy. Help us help others. Merry Christmas and please join us.
So there's our Facebook event page. Uh, we got th three guests signed up. <laughs> <sighs> We're doing what we can. I sent out a press release to all the media people in Chicago this morning, hoping that they'll carry it. But please, everybody, if you're on Facebook, uh, show us some love and let us know if you're showing up by uh, clicking through <laughs> and identifying yourself as attending. Uh, we want to get some sense that people are going to show up and donate toys and food and see a show and have a sing along and have a fun time together at the holiday. Uh, and then again, here's our page on the reader. So help us help others, everybody, please. We want to see you there. We want people to come out for our live stream and participate in interview and say hello to everybody who participates in our, in our show uh, regularly on Tuesdays and Fridays in the live chat. There you so, go. That's help. All got, please guys. help out folks. Help out folks. Come on. It's the right thing to do. What's wrong with you? Mark your calendars. As Kira said Tuesday, uh, if you have other plans, cancel them. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, <laughs> join us instead. Yeah, so so there you go. You get to hang out with us. Come on, folks. So uh, here's what I'm. Uh, so Jerry, obviously, what I need from you before this weekend ends, send me that updated uh, commercial so I can send it as a PSA on okay. Can TV. So that way, it's all ready to go. And I have a little tease. We are in one way or another covering the. Mayoral forum, a mayoral debate forum next Tuesday. Uh, not right. sure if it's going to live stream or if it's going to be pre recorded segments. We're hoping we can get a wired connection to live stream stably that night. If not, we're not going to do Wi Fi. It's, it's, it, you, you don't want to see it that way. Uh, but yeah. we would then uh, still record interviews with any candidates that we can, as Kit did back in 2019. It's also linked on our, our YouTube Chicago Corner channel. Kit did some extraordinary work interviewing the candidates that night. And if we can't live stream the event and talk to people in real time, we will definitely uh, get some interviews with people to share on next Friday night's show. Spoiler alert. I'm going to give everyone my heads up question right now. Do you want to know what it's going to be? Dibs or no dibs? No. <laughs> uh, I, oh, where, where is, Cubs? No. Where is Lori Lightfoot? If she ah, can't. that's right. Because but you know, Ed, kid, I don't know that she was invited because this is an invitation only debate forum. I mean, I wonder if they invited her because she's not on the list. Well, then, that, 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 then that, that's a question asked. Hey, did you invite her? Or did you not invite her? And hey, if you were Mayor Lightfoot, would you show up here or not? And if she was invited, where's she at? Yep. Where is Lightfoot? Where's Lori? Like, well, where's Waldo? Then, it, where's gentlemen, Lori? anything else you want to share before we convene? We uh, depart for the evening. Uh, yes. Uh, in like 13 minutes, my interview that I did was Jesse Jett will be uh the clipped interview will be uh premiering on our hard lens media youtube channel awesome. uh in like 13 minutes so be sure to check it out if you missed it switch over and check that out everybody ed i know what i know what ed's gonna share do you i do are you sure i'm positive okay head over to edheller.com <laughs> and check out that spiffy chicago corner logo that i have over there that says that hey ed's on this show um, and then click on the merch links, and then there's some thing about pizza, and um, I forget what else I got on there. All right, guys. thing with a dude with a bacon head. I don't know what I was thinking when I created that guy. Don't worry, Chance the Snapper is going to win the 2024 nomination for the Volcano Party. Kid, it's good to have you back again. We 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 were yeah. worried about you after you know this happened get your hand off my penis no what is the charge eating a meal a succulent chinese meal gentlemen this is democracy manifest we you ran know, into, we ran into one of kit's clones at the patio theater also i gotta upload yeah. that clip so. yeah that was yeah. flick cabello wait 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 because he whoa, likes whoa. movies whoa wait we there was a clone loose where was the track teams at God damn it. I, look, I mean, you know, we, we spotted him. Uh, well, it, it's difficult because first we thought it was you. Oh my God. And uh, so actually, you know, you, you watched and we watching that promo ad. That's not yeah. Kit. That's that's his clone flick. We knew it wasn't Kit when he started licking the camera lens, causing some of those focus issues with the, <laughs> of the shots in the video. Yeah, and then and then of course, and as usual, the clones they like to flee, so he ran away. Yeah, I'll have that video uh, maybe for Tuesday's show. 
if we're if, if, and that reminds me, have we ever tracked down Brit Cabello or is he still on the loose? No, the no, he's, he's still loose. fighting King Charles, that mad bastard. Gentlemen, as always, thank you so much for joining tonight and participating in the show. It was a slice. I think we had a good broadcast tonight. To everyone else across Chicago, please remember as we go into this weekend to watch out for each other, stay safe, be vigilant, take care of each other. And remember, if it's happening on the streets, you'll hear about it here on Chicago Corner. Not sure yet what's happening next Tuesday if we are going to forego the live stream uh, because we're pre-recording at the Copernicus Center or... We may be live streaming Tuesday night. That's up in the air, but you will get updates through our social media and our website and our YouTube channel. Until we meet again, please stay safe, Chicago. Get out and don't come back until you've redeemed yourselves. You still here? It's over. Go home. Go.